go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's 531. Um, welcome, everyone. And let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we need a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I'll move to approve tonight's agenda as posted. Having a motion and a second, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. So we'll move on into the budget workshop. Okay. Um, so it looks like we've been presented with the 22-23 certified salary schedule, salary matrix um, for last year and last year's classified salary schedule and last year's admin schedule and the fund summary. So I think we should probably start on the fund summary. So if y'all want to open that up. Okay, so this includes the, the uh, proposed budget for this year, is that correct? Brian? Correct. Okay. Um, well, she converted it to a Google Doc. Um, I did it in Excel and made a PDF because I have to send it to the paper. So Do you want me to open it differently? That didn't. It just looks like you're missing a column. Yeah, if you just keep it as the PDF. Okay. That. Or not that way. Just You had it as the PDF right there. Did I? Yeah. Where is it? I uh, just. If you. Right, right, right there. there. Up, nope, up one. Nope, where? Up one from this where you were. Yep. yep. And you just happen to be, I mean, you could download, either open it in a rack of rat or just keep it here and just hit the hit little, the little uh, plus button down the the plus button right down there and it'll zoom it in. Yeah, right there. The plus, yep. there you go. Or, yeah, there that you go. That just zooms it in, but I'm still on uh, Google, no? Well, you're... It's just oh, not you're, you're, you're in the browser right, right now. Right. Yeah, you didn't convert it to a Google Doc. Yeah. Perfect. You, so the other way you we could you could download it out of the Google Drive and open it with Acrobat and you could blow it up a little bit more. So we do that. Um, so or whatever okay works with the board. Or if they'll see it on their screen, I guess whatever. Yeah, we've got it on our screen. So yeah. Be, so we're good. Okay. And and so for this. You know, this is that format that I've talked about before that is the required format for us to publish in the, in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. All the other information after this, the fund summary, this sheet, mm -hmm. and then the individual funds are really the same information presented, I think, in an easier way to view it. Okay. I, um, but this is the form that goes in the paper because this is what is prescribed. Um, you know, the State Department approved form. So this is what is in the actual advertisement. And it shows our prior year actuals from 2019, 20, 2020, and 21. Mm -hmm. The 2021-22 numbers are budget, they're not actuals, because actuals aren't done yet. They, right. um, so that really, even though the heading says prior year actual slash budget, it is just budget. Correct. But I, I, I don't alter their form. And then the proposed budget for this year. Okay. And it, you know, the left is the general fund, the right is all other funds. And, and this, the next sheet is sort of similar, you know, and that's sort of the sheet that we tweak for the monthly report. Mm -hmm. And this one's sometimes a little bit better to look at because it has proposed than other funds then combines them in one column. Mm -hmm. But it just has the budget, it doesn't have all those previous years. Okay. So those two are summary funds and then all the pages behind it are all the individual funds that make up those two summary sheets. Okay. 
so that we could get into more details there if you wanted to break it down to individual funds. Okay. So why do we have nothing in the capital outlay just because we don't want to set it aside or just pull it discretionary or? We're not spending any capital outlay in the general fund, mm -hmm. but we are do have budgeted capital outlay in other funds mm -hmm. of um, 1.468 if you look. Capital outlay in all the other funds is 2.29 million if you looked at um, but with, but with scroll up, Trustee yeah. Grissom, scroll within up. that um, that what you were just that looking at, if you mm -hmm. look at the fund yeah. balance, it shows that it's at twenty three percent. So there there there's definitely money there for the board to to, to make some decisions about with regard to some capital outlay mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. that we could you could either budget right now and say that's we want to spend this much, and Brian could write it in or. The board just knows that there's some there's some money and we're we're well over the eight to sixteen percent for fund balance mm -hmm. that our policy asks us to have. So there's some one time dollars there for the board to make some decisions about in the general fund. In the general fund. <clears throat> what is scheduled for the two point two nine million in all the other funds? So if we go to capital projects, the first is I'll go to fund for 20, which is the cap, the plant facility fund. <clears throat> and if you want, we could go to that individual sheet. We're, all, we're looking for 420. So which is way down, it's, it's near one of the last ones. Oh, so they're not in numerical order. And so. It's page 22. Yeah. So there's. That, that's the revenues and so on that sheet the revenues show we'll probably get a little bit of local tax revenues very minor and maybe some interest but overall we're you know that fund is expiring this year so we're not going to collect any new property taxes on the plant facility fund we have a approximate starting balance in July depending on when some POs come in of 1.1 million <clears throat> so I have a little bit of supplies and materials budgeted on a PO that's already outstanding that it's not going to finish until the next fiscal year starting in July. The 907,550, so the remainder of capital projects. Of those, of that 970, here's we have the John Brown roof schedule that's not going to happen until next fiscal this summer, but it'll hit in July. So that was approved by the board for 128,000. The Athol carpet that will be a summer project will hit next that you know our next year for forty nine thousand. Half of the Betty Kiefer roof we've paid half because they've ordered materials. They'll complete that. That's another one hundred ninety three thousand. Um, the Lakeland High School bleachers of fifty three thousand. Timberlake High School bleachers of one hundred eighty four thousand. Mountain View High School carpet of forty nine thousand, almost fifty five hundred seventy four. Uh, we had, a, uh, we haven't paid for that. It will come in. We had the fire panel at Athol um, is is at end of life, and we have to replace it for eight thousand dollars. The electrical for the uh, for the bleachers is roughly fifteen thousand for those other projects and uh, parking lots that are scheduled for this summer that the board had approved for forty seven. So that gives us seven hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars of that nine hundred and seven that sort of those boards have already approved those projects. But they're, they're just not gonna happen this June in this fiscal year. Um, so that gives us a balance of a hundred and seventy nine or let's say a five twenty seven or let's say a hundred and eighty thousand. That that is not that's open. That I've not designated that for a project. And then the last that transfer out of the hundred and eighty nine six oh eight that is the dollars from land sales that we put in for future land purchases. We don't have to. It's kind of a reserve. Right, and so uh, that was for a sale of 10 acres out in Hauser and for a parcel up in Spirit Lake. That's, and we've been just sort of holding on to it. 
Um, so as what I'm recommending this budget is that we take those dollars and the plant facility, facility fund sort of closes and the special purpose fund goes away, that we'd move those to a local fund for projects, just a different fund number because it's not a, it's not a levy fund. Um, the board also, if you wanted to use those dollars for a capital project, we certainly could. But right now it's just in holding pattern for those. So there's really $180,000 out of the 907 that is some future projects that I have not, I budgeted the capacity to spend it, but I didn't have a specific project. You know, we can have, you know, those conversations on where the board wants those priorities. Right. Um, the bleachers and all that you were mentioning though, the, the vote on that was ESSER funds. So that would be separate from this? I don't believe I can, all capital projects from the state, mm -hmm. we have to submit a, um, a capital expenditure request from the state and get it approved before we can, and get approved from the state before we can spend it <coughs> when we do our grant claim. Mm -hmm. And after talking with the state, I don't believe that bleachers are gonna count for COVID related well, was it COVID related? The ESSER 3, the conversation was, we need to go back and look at that because that was the vote. The conversation was the discretionary funds. And I specifically asked for a definition of discretionary and that was the vote was to use those funds. But either way, I think we need to, to we, look at that just to, just to see, because um, there was a discretionary fund portion or, or I'm sorry, discretionary dollars in the SR3 um, funds or, or go back and look at the actual conversation that we had about the bleachers? Well, we, we could on that. I, well, I'm telling you, on, on ESSER funds, they're, they're not, it's not completely 100% any use we want to do. No, I understand, okay. believe me. I'm and, and more so versed in that. I don't need an right. explanation of oh. that. All I'm doing is recalling the conversation that we had and I want to make sure that whatever the board decided you know i'm a little gun shy because for three years now we've been trying to get the doors replaced at the lakeland junior high and that has not happened so when i see that we have not purposely taken money for capital outlay to say these are the things that the board's been wanting to do because i i get the fact that we have extra dollars out there not extra that's not a good word to use <laughs> but budgeted we yeah we have um a little bit of leniency, right, for things that we can accomplish. Um, I just want to make sure that as the year goes on, as been my has been my experience the last three years, those dollars end up in other places, and I don't want to see that happen. Athol has great needs. The junior high has needs for the door. Um, I know that last time I was up at Spirit Lake Elementary, they have needs. Uh, I just want to make sure that those needs are met. That's my, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but that's my <clears throat> wish is that, you know, we actually start tackling those projects. And I heard you're reading off that list, but did we get that list that you were just, what, is that on a certain page? Those are my notes. Oh, okay. Um, but those are all things that the board has approved. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I guess on the ESSER with the bleachers, I think I don't, I can't go back to exact words. I, sure, sure. I knew or I, at the time that definitely I was not 100% sure that ESSER dollars could be used for bleachers. Yeah. There's gonna, I mean, it's supposed to be direct, like you do an HVAC project, probably the school buses, you know, I've requested school buses for ESSER dollars and that's, in, that's part of capital and another fund that mm -hmm. we can show. I haven't got approval from that yet from sure. the state. Yeah. So I I think for the bleachers, since it's super gray, that we could take it from the general fund or we can take it from this plant facility fund. I don't think we should try to do a federal grant claim for bleachers that really aren't COVID related. Mm -hmm. In fact, they would argue that it's against COVID related because you have a crowd. So we need to find something else. To, to, to work. Well, Correct. Sir, we can, we, and, and we certainly can do that. Yeah, and we need a better understanding of the ESSER 3 funds because there was a lot of leniency in some of them. And my recollection, which could be totally off of the ESSER 3 funds, was that there was much more leniency in those funds. 
than prior. Um, but I could be wrong. I just want to make sure that the capital projects get done. I have great concern when I go throughout the school district and I see the condition of the schools. I just, I, I, it's unacceptable. You know, we have to do something. And I know we have other needs because the other concern is all of these classrooms that are going to be exploding and we can't add on to the building. So in my head again, the only thing I see to resolve the issue is more portables. And those we know are gonna be, you know, well, I mean, we have no choice. We can't build another building and we cannot saddle teachers with 30 kids to a classroom. You know, I mean, I don't know what you, what your uh, suggestion would be for that, but that's, um, I mean, it, it's getting, you know, we're being. Portables in is uh, pouring money down a rabbit hole as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yeah. That, they're, they're, it's actually a waste of money. Yeah, well, I don't know. What I don't do you do with the overcrowded classrooms then? Yeah, we don't have any when more we room. Can't, when we can't, when <clears throat> those that came before us didn't set aside monies to build new schools, the reliance is solely on the taxpayer, and obviously that was shut down by the taxpayer. They said, no. We need a solution, mm -hmm. and granted, I don't like the idea of portables, but I would wholeheartedly shower every elementary school with portables as opposed to having 31 to 35 kids in a classroom because those children don't learn. I mean, you're creating an environment that is not conducive to teaching children. You're just creating an environment to manage classrooms. So, I, I mean, I'm really concerned because I know we desperately need to address um, the growth that we have. I mean, it's already here and it's only going to continue. Right. So, um, and we don't have the resources right now. I mean, oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> we have unbudgeted monies that are, that have accumulated um, and we, we need to solve this. At least if we're not solving it today, we need to have a plan in effect that we can support moving forward knowing this is how we're going to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, which we need to build at least one, if not two more elementary schools. Where's the money to do that? So that's all I'm saying. I mean, obviously this is might not be the exact location, just what I'm looking for the budgeted dollars. I know that there's funds sitting there, but uh, we, we have a lot of needs coming up in this year. So we, we have a hundred eighty nine, roughly hundred eighty nine thousand dollars in facility funds, unplanned expenditure at this point. Unplanned, correct. Okay. And so let's, let's make a note of that and, and see what else we have as we go along here in the way of available capital funds. Sure. And, and so for I'll go to the next capital funds that are we have expenditures on. If you just go to real quick on fund 424, which is the bus depreciation fund, which will continue, it's $420,000. Those are the buses that have been approved. They have not been delivered. They'll probably be delivered in August. So that's why they're, it's just waiting for those to show up. Um, and they're, those are the and so if those show up, we get our state revenues from uh, the bus depreciation from that. And with our start balance, it's pretty good right now because we haven't written the check for those buses that we ha did have issue the PO. We could have you know, approximately 370,000 remaining after those buses are purchased. And so- that's, that's with the assumption you get your bus depreciation funds in? Yeah, at the end of the year. Okay. Correct. They're sort of late with that payment. That's like the last payment in the year. Um, they actually give us that money usually after the fiscal year, but it's credited back. Um, and then the last capital projects that are, or the, where the big capital projects are is 
actually in fund 250, which is ESSER 3. And so ESSER 3, we have about, the total allocation is $5.8 million, and the grant ends in two years. So for this year, for ESSER 3, I budgeted half to the 2.9, $2,935,275 is half of ESSER 3 available. We haven't drawn down any ESSER 3 funds yet. Okay, can I interrupt you? Mm -hmm. Before we jumped into the ESSER 3, for child nutrition fund 290, you have 498 in capital outlay, 498,000. What and is? Those are the projects that uh, the board has approved. They haven't happened. Um, the Was that the steamer tables? The, the steamer tables. tables. The truck has still not been the delivered. Um, yeah, and those. And the lunch tables. And the lunch tables. The lunch, and the yeah, tables. and I think there might. <laughs> I knew what you were There might even been an oven in there too. Some <laughs> ovens and things. Okay, so those are the things we've discussed <clears throat> that we've approved. And we just forward. haven't got delivered. So it's really almost sort of a carryover. And then, and then if Kevin wants to do some future things next year what he, he wants to replace some more equipment we'll come to the board with that before we move forward okay and that capital outlay within the child nutrition is because of the excess funding that we have in child nutrition that we've received through ESSER funds is that correct no, no. the the <clears throat> excess uh revenues really because of the programs generated that revenue be and the reason that it's really up is that for the past two years, meals have been free right. for That's every right. student. So our participation is way up. Okay. And with the participation up and getting the reimbursements from the National School Lunch Program, it's really created you know, higher revenues than, um, than traditional. Okay. So it's, <clears throat> we're, Actually, there's a rule in the food school nutrition program that you can only have three months of operating balance. In other words, you have, if you're generating the revenues, you have to spend it. Right. <clears throat> and so we actually got a letter from the state saying that you're getting close to how, what you're planning to spend it. So we wrote a letter to them um, saying, well, we have, you know, we've ordered this truck, things. we've ordered this thing, right. we're moving forward. And, and these things also okay. next year to try to whittle that down. So okay. we're definitely, we'll continue to invest in that program mm -hmm. as the revenues come up. But yeah, that those have been those dollars that uh, no ESSER dollars have gone towards uh, the okay. food nutrition program. So the 498, is all of that committed or not all of it? I think not all of it's committed. I think Kevin threw, I asked him to help me with budget. He, he there's other equipment he wants to buy next year and he'll next come year. with those. Trying to put a little capacity. So some money set aside to do Correct. That. Okay. <clears throat> good. You can go back up to the ESSER funds. Sorry. Oh no, that that's good. Um, and so the ESSER funds just overall, we're thinking of you know the two point nine, or trying to draw half of it down this year, then have half for next year, um, and that's and then they're done. That's the end of the grant. So. We have supplies and materials of 1.5 million. That would be the curriculum adoption if you move forward the curriculum adoption. Okay. Um, this is for science. For science, it can go directly towards the ESSER 3 learning loss, and so it fits right in with the math and That's the K-8 science and the 912 math. Yeah. Yep. Um, and we certainly, the 415 of capital outlay is the Timberlake High School HVAC, which I've actually asked the state for approval and haven't got back yet, but hopefully we'll have that. That project was uh, okayed by the board, I think in February or March. And the Athol and Spirit Lake Elementary gym heaters mm -hmm. to replace those. And then our bus purchases, the other two that we just did, remember we said we were gonna go use ESSER funds for those on those. So that adds up to the 415, that's the only capital. So that's in this budget, but we could certainly add more. The salaries and benefits are not designated for anybody right now. What that capacity was for was in case we had growth and you know, sort of how we've had emergency levies in the past that we could use maybe those dollars for that. 
And so I just threw in some dollars a way to draw down. Um, we could also put staff that are eligible for that drawdown dollars. And you know, if you did it for one year and they were budgeting the general fund, it would give you more capacity in the general fund to, because you didn't spend the dollar over there, you spend it over here and fund balance would go up, that then you could dedicate those excess funds maybe for capital projects. If we didn't have a big need for an emergency levy or those type of expenditures in September. Okay. Does that make sense? So there's no commitment at this point for salary and benefits in terms of personnel, it's just there. It's just there for capacity. We could certainly, um, so we could shift that to capital projects. We could, I, one thing I, I'm concerned about <clears throat> is that, especially with how long it's taking to get things, is that we may just have to move some budgeted salaries from the general fund over to ESSER just to draw it down because we're gonna run out of time. That two years will hit us faster and then we'll have the capacity in the general fund to go do things. We, that may be a way we have to approach this. Other districts have done that because if we planned some capital project and didn't come in and it, we could be, we, it, we, we could, could run out the, of time. The dollars. Correct. So we have two years uh, to, uh, to draw these down. We've actually only budgeted half the money. I, yeah, point. correct. I didn't budget the whole 5.8 million for this so year. The, the following year is one that could be tough in terms of getting things done quickly enough, if I understand. Right. So, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of it for some of these dollars, you know, if you have eligible expenses and eligible salary expenses that, that can be used, you know, a lot of times you take advantage of those dollars. It, it, it's one reason why our general fund has been growing and then you can use those, then you have more flexibility with general fund dollars than ESSER dollars. Yeah. So it's sort of a, a smart way to go about it. There's been some districts that they've gone 100%, they've, they did that full meal deal and they've claimed all the way all their ESSER three dollars. Um, We've tried to keep more, let's do ESSER 1 first, let's do ESSER 2 next, and now we're hitting ESSER 3 for the two year. We're, we're trying to sort of stage it mm -hmm. so that we didn't have maybe as big of a bubble or something. But theoretically, we could generate uh, beyond the 415 in this fund for some more capital outlay. Correct. And chose to do and, that. And right, and so for example, when just so you know, also for like the, uh, the Spirit Lake and Athol Gym, you know, because it is federal dollars and we're going to draw these down, you know, we have to get the quote with Davis Bacon wages, ends up being about 20% more generally. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes if we do use salaries, it, you know, we, get we can get more bang for our buck if we go that way as opposed to the capital projects here. Um, so anyway, that's just things to consider. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. We just need a plan, I guess, yeah. for how, how that would get accomplished in terms of if we're going to leave the salary and benefits at that level, uh, we need to have some plan for you know, how we're going to use that yeah. and for whom uh, so it all makes sense. And obviously then if we're pulling that personnel out of the general fund, then those monies would be available in the general fund for some of the purpose. Correct. And so... Right, so so let's say that you know uh, some of the easy justifications for ESSER dollars are custodial staff for keep you know COVID related, keeping the buildings clean, tech staff, um, definitely uh, you know classroom teachers to maintain operations, you know so. I mean, those are all. We have uh, MTSS teachers yeah. at our, both of our high schools and our middle schools. So that's learning loss specific, which would fit in. That fits into a lot of the grant parameters that when you draw down and they, um, the reporting's quite extensive and, and how you're spending the money for the ESSER dollars. I just finished a really big report on it. So they're, they all sort of dovetail in with the, the grant parameters. And so, for example, let's say I've, you know, budgeted the John Brown custodian general fund, which we have. If we said, well, we're gonna use some extra dollars here to pay for custodial staff, well, if I 
you know, then effectively draw down that salary here. It is budgeted, so it's it's not like I didn't budget in general fund and just budgeted an S or three. Does that make sense, I think. Trustee Jones? Yeah. I mean, well, if I if I took that position yeah. out of the general fund and put it in an ESSER, right. then really next year I have a problem, right? Because now I yeah, built a general right. fund without that position. Yeah, right. But I built a general fund with that position, so now I want to leave that fund in the position, but maybe we pay over here. And, and so the general fund will go up, and then those are conversations that the board could have on, okay, we have some extra capacity. Do we want to take those dollars and do you know, projects X, Y, and Z. So do you have any thoughts, Lisa, about uh, this scenario that we're talking about here? As far as the ESSER dollars? Yeah. Um, well, it, I guess it makes the most sense to me that we, we use um, salaries and benefits on the ESSER side and not the, and, and do what Brian's talking about and take the money that then we're not spending because we budgeted in the general fund and use that for the capital outlay because then we're not paying the additional 20% in So you get cost for 20% more value the other way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Feel, it just feels like we're, we're getting more for our money that way. Mm -hmm. The other piece as I'm listening to Brian that's resonating is we know for sure that salaries and benefits are strong qualifiers for us or dollars where some of our capital projects might be a little bit iffy. And so the, the best way to know we're going to be able to do the things the board wants to do is to put the salaries and benefits here and use the um, general fund for the capital projects. Mm -hmm. and, and we could certainly in the general fund let, you know, we're, we have a, a healthy fund balance now. <laughs> you know, and if the board didn't want it to be in the, you know, that's the big pot, right? That's the big soup in the general fund and say, wanted to move you know what, X amount of dollars, say for lack of a better number, a million dollars for five projects or what they might be, you know, we could certainly do a transfer out into a separate fund where it's easier to sort of see what projects are for, happening. Because it's not, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we can certainly do that. If that's, um, you know, and that's sort of, in a way, the plant facility fund, but we don't have to. We can, you can, the general fund can be used for anything, it's general, but um, it some, that, that's sort of how the board would like to see it, what makes you more comfortable and things well, like that. And respectfully, I think the public would like to see here's the money that we've set aside to do work, here's the work we've done, and at the end of the day, we have this many dollars left over or not. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and yeah, and that, and from a, how we would report that like in our financials that would be easier to see if you did the transfer mm -hmm. right, right. And, and I I get that I just I think when we're saying well we did take some money from over here and we took some money from over there and it's just it's not clear and so you don't see where the money was and where it went because we're pulling it from here there and everywhere but going back to this uh, fund uh, 250. My question is, and I think I already know the answer, but I just want to clarify. So the million that you have allocated for salaries and benefits, it's a one million twenty thousand two seventy five. Um, that doesn't have to be spent on salaries and benefits, but you just plugged it in there as in anticipation of possibly utilizing it there to to do the old. Switcheroo, or it's, it's not a switcheroo. It's just the no, it takes just place a, of the emergency yes, levy. Yes. And we should we have to do that, but we could just take people who are currently budgeted and and attach names to that so that we free up money and it's however the board wants to do that. Well, and I want to make I want to be clear <laughs> that what I hear you saying is the salaries and benefits that ESSER funds could potentially cover have already been budgeted in the general fund. And so what we're not doing is creating a deficit in the sense that when we come back the next year, when we don't have the ESSER funds, we don't have the money to pay the people that the ESSER dollars have covered. Correct, okay. yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. you know, as we look at you know, budgets that 
Yes, and it was always the qualifier with what we know today. So, you know, our reality next year, depending on, you know, let's say enrollment well, funding went away yeah. or some other factors that were beyond our control, then maybe we do have some, a different dynamic to, to address. Um, the, the nice thing, um, but given that everything's equal, yes. Um, but I, you know, I mean, I think that is sort of the good place the district is in is that, um, you know, with some of the, uh, you know, building up these balances and these funds and especially the general fund, um, if there was, if the unexpected happened or something like that happened, we, it's not like we were at a level where it's like panic mode. I mean, you would have, you know, a year, maybe a little more to be planful on how you might address that new reality. And hopefully we don't have to worry about that, but you never know. Yeah, the, so the, the, the increase in the fund balance comes a little bit from using SR1 and SR2 dollars, right, to all <coughs> doing exactly what you're talking about, where we already had things budgeted in the general fund and we used the SR dollars instead, so the, we didn't expend the dollars we had budgeted. So I, what we're talking about is just continuing to do more of what we've been doing. Um, to, and that get, it does give us the option then to not have to get the approval from the state for the projects. Obviously, they're not going to approve, new, the state's not going to approve ESSER dollars to be used for new siting at AFL. Mm -hmm. But we have built up a fund balance, which would allow us to use those dollars. For See, and that was my understanding of what we were using for the bleachers, not that we were using ESSER funds for the bleachers. It was my understanding that we were using that fund, or the general fund dollars that were being supplemented by ESSER funds in other ways and we have that surplus in the general fund and that's what we were using for the bleachers and okay. rather than that. And trust me, right. right. And we could certainly do that and I could, you know, change this and then that would just give us the, you know, roughly 300,000 or maybe not, not that much, but let's say 250, 275 um, capacity in the plant fund for additional projects. So I guess it's, if you pay the plant fund, you pay general fund in, in the big picture, mm -hmm. it's six one day, way half a dozen another, honestly. But, but that's what, that was my understanding of, of where those dollars were, were coming from, was just that we had the additional monies, not necessarily that it was... Because we had the, because of the way we use the ESSER fund. So it and part right. of it was the enrollment, the difference in using the enrollment funding. Correct, and enrollment we is... We had that additional funding, so that's what we were using. And, and the enrollment funding definitely is uh, another reason why our fund balances should go up yeah. quite a bit next year. Or at least our guesses. So, looking at that one, the 415 is all committed. The one and a half is all committed for textbook options and so forth. Hopefully the one and a half is high. Yeah. <laughs> Hoping we're not coming I, in I at one and a half. I put in a little bit fluff. Yeah. I, I, it's um, just I, hard to know right now. In this I, did, I just didn't know what the cost would be. And, right. Um, and so looking past just for this fiscal year, that would give us another year, if we did half of the ESSER funds, of another curriculum adoption. Mm -hmm. And then there's, at that point, it would have been then how do we address it moving forward? But mm -hmm. at least for the next two years, we we can take advantage of these funds. And the million dollars in salary and benefits, uh, if that ends up getting uh, spent for existing positions that are currently general fund positions, then the general fund's balance is going to grow by that amount. Even not much more. For a year. You would think. we have to go back or something. Correct. Like okay. Well, we need to determine how we can maintain within the budget an annual curriculum adoption of whatever because if we're on a five to six year uh, ratio it would seem that every single year we're going to end up purchasing curriculum we don't have anything in the budget specific for that mm -hmm. and we don't have anything in the budget that I can tell where we are just allocating money aside for capital projects that are that we should be we don't have anything for 
uh, what was that fund? You sent us something. The land, 2% of the budget. 2% of the budget <coughs> going towards. Oh. Uh, yeah, that we, we're we required to do that and we don't. But we do, well, yeah, but we, we actually do. do. Where? That, our, that's. It's line item, yeah. It's, our expenditures on our maintenance staff are part of that, those dollars. Yes, so right. our people maintaining the buildings is part of supporting the buildings. So that's, and those numbers are generated from State Department reports that we just submit with our, with our fiscal data, but um, the state verifies that we are maintaining the statutory requirements. Okay, so if <coughs> if we're maintaining the statutory requirement by simply mm -hmm. paying staff to maintain, then we're not getting ahead of any of our problems right. when we have to constantly be coming back to the table going, apples needed sodding for about 10 years and we still don't have it. The junior high doors needed to be replaced and I know for a fact <laughs> this board three years ago said replace the doors and we were told no, they were repaired. So, I mean, those types of maintenance repairs have to get done and they're not. And we don't have, what I don't see is where we can um, pull that money to make it happen so that we can be moving forward on the actual maintenance repairs. Yes, please. <laughs> let's, let's go to the general fund and the fund balance. Okay, well, I'll Unless you want to roll through something else. Well, I mean, you can no. correct me. Well, I, I'm not <clears throat> opposed to that. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, I I think that the um, all all I can say about the Lakeland Middle School doors mm -hmm. is I did what I was directed to by my direct supervisor. We've had a conversation. I know. I know so that. I that's all I can tell you. So that if, if there was directions that were other than that, that was not communicated to me I, by my supervisor. I accept that. Okay. The <laughs> other projects, I mean, we've spent significant amounts of dollars um, since I've been here on capital needs. We replaced the Spirit Lake roof. We replaced the Timberlake High School roof. We replaced the Timberlake, the Twin Lakes Elementary roof, the Garwood roof. Right. We've, I mean, those are significant projects from the plant facility fund is where they are funded. Um, and now we're doing Betty Kiefer, John Brown, mm -hmm. Lakeland High School roof was half a million dollars. And we just last year we spent, I believe, what it was 350, 400,000 on the Lakeland Middle School roof. So the, we, we have been doing significant investments, I think, in the buildings, and, but we have not had a, you know, the, the reality in the state of Idaho is the big dollar items for facilities come from either a plant facility fund or a bond okay. at the local level. That's what's funded by this. The state does not fund facilities at the state level. Correct. So we've had the plant facility fund for many years and usually that's used for aggressive maintenance not for a new building it's just not big enough yeah. um, a, a new elementary school if we were building today is going to at least be 15 million dollars yeah. that's but, mm -hmm. but the plant facility levy is the line item i think that michelle's looking for it was the line item for yeah, capital the confusion projects is that, that, and it's that gone you, know, you know the district meets that that minimum state standard in terms of expenditures for maintenance and repairs but it's in that line item in the general fund as opposed to a chunk of money set aside for what you and call we've been right and, and but so, but when we replaced for example the Timberlake High School roof that counted towards that 2% oh, sure, for that year absolutely. that so those numbers account I our thresholds about 900,000 and a million dollars a year yeah so the Betty Kiefer roof being you know, almost four hundred thousand dollars is is almost just that one project is almost half of our obligation by that statute. But I think what I think what Michelle's getting at is that we really need to look at creating a replacement fund where we are putting money away for these projects so that they so that it's not just oh we have some extra money let's do this project no we are being progressive and putting 
money away ahead of time and building up a fund to do those major projects on an ongoing basis. So you're looking that, at that's a legitimate uh, scenario, but I think Brian has the, the seed for that in the creation of the new fund that you're going to transfer the hundred eighty. Well, and, and we have a and that fund going forward could have money put into it from whatever sources we decide, and, but then that's the designated fund for capital improvement. Well, and then there's your two percent right there. You just you don't have to say, okay, we pay these maintenance salaries and we pay no we could just take two percent and put it in this replacement fund and that and we have put money towards our facilities every year yeah. well we i mean that's certainly the board could do i mean really when we look at if you're looking at like setting aside you're going to have to take a look at where we're at right now and where the general fund money is going let's say you're going to look at the general fund and move that well, it's, it's salaries and benefits. And so it's either, you know, you spend less in those areas, which is either less people, or you, or you keep the same amount of people and you pay them less. Which legally we can do. N right. Um, or if you got new revenues, you didn't, all the revenues didn't, you know, go towards, um, you know, sort of those staffing things. So that's always the challenge because that's, you know, a need there also with just, uh, you know, with the pressures on wages right now. And that it's not, maybe it's, it's a little, it's even, I guess, maybe even a little more pressure now than previous years, but it's always been there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are really, you know, sort of where you have to yeah. try to find that balance. So all of matter of balancing mm -hmm. and, and prioritizing. Because I mean, prior to the end of this coming year, we, we've had a plant facility levy for as long as I've been in the district, and that was the line item that you're talking about. That right. was the one, or the 2%, um, that was set aside every year for these projects, and we've opted not to run that. So now we're to being tasked with how do we continue to put that money aside with I bringing in one point one four six million dollars less than what we have been, so mm -hmm. I guess that sometimes <clears throat> means we have to make hard decisions um, because right now we have more money going into the fund balance simply because we've offset what we usually spend out of general fund with ESSER dollars. But that's stopping pretty soon, and so then we we do have to make hard decisions because we only have what we have. And if we're going to say we're going to every year put a million dollars, then we have to figure out where's that coming from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's and it's going forward where the real problem will occur because whatever <coughs> dollars we might choose to put in this special account for capital outlay out of the general fund, those are one-time dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no replacement for those dollars. Mm -hmm. So once you spend them. Then you, you come to the end of your rope with that with that fund unless you find some other source and I don't know I don't know what it could be because we yeah. in essence we've looked at, uh, at the few funds that have capital outlay. Food service takes care of itself, uh, you know, and you got a couple of others, but uh, in, in the long term, you know, not having that plant facility levy is is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. <coughs> I'm, I'm totally new and I forgive my ignorance, but um, I'm just reading a little bit more about this process. And what about the facilities maintenance matching funds? Um, is that something that the school gets funds for from the state of Idaho? We get lottery dollars that mm -hmm. are, um, you know, that gets, that are part of, you know, the they ask you to spend on facilities when we yeah. easily meet that threshold. What does that amount to? It really varies sometimes 250 a year. Oh, this year is going to be, thousand. yeah, yeah, this year that those um, revenues are actually going to be up. I think during <laughs> people, COVID people, people were gambling more. <laughs> Maybe nobody was winning. 
Um, but they said that would be sort of a one-time thing and probably would go back down. Yeah, right, 250, 300. Yeah, we used to get you know, some federal forest funds and <coughs> some PLA 74 money and other kinds of things. Most of that has gone and, away. And the federal 20, forest 000, fund is... $20,000. We got the federal forest <laughs> funds, we, we did get twenty about 22000 this year. So I... And we have bought like um, let's let's do the doors with that twenty grand. How about that? Mm -hmm. Well, from my understanding, it's going to take a little more than twenty grand. Oh, well, maybe I don't. Know. <laughs> the um, but anyway, those federal forest funds that yeah we we've also gotten like but a, a van for maintenance or sometimes some equipment we have bought with those funds. You know, sort of one-time expenses. But those funds stand on their own. Uh, I mean, we could we could transfer if you know if we wanted to try to suck things together in that respect, but typically those those funds you know, are in existence because they're required to, to be there. Correct. And uh, th that's where this problem of getting a few dollars here and a few dollars there uh, is a little bit confusing, but... <clears throat> I don't know, in, in terms of that Federal forest money and that kind of stuff is, is that scheduled for capital outlay? I um, it supplies. I so just sort of supplies and materials and purchase services. So what we spent on on the federal forest money recently is uh, we belong to the uh, professional technical cooperative North Idaho. So. Um, before I got here, they were using the federal forest funds to sort of pay that eight thousand dollars to belong to that cooperative. So I've continued that Nip Tech, I think it's called, and um, we've done some small purchases to out of those funds, usually for a, a, a facility project or if they need things. So like a new scoreboard was at Lakeland Middle <coughs> that was um, part of that cost was donated by STCU, but you know, to get some of the electronics and some of those things was like a one-time short expense. Um, total cost was some of those, like that particular one was under 5000 so it wasn't capital, it was just supplies and materials. But it was sort of a facility type thing. I think we bought a lawnmower out of there one year, one of the riding lawnmowers. The membership you talked about, did we get $8,000 <coughs> worth of benefit out of that? <laughs> That's not the finance director's question. That would be the instructional people. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I'm not sure I do either. I, don't I think know. Colby would say we do. Oh, so it's a K-Tech? It's sort of it's associated with K-Tech and the support of that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> okay. So there's a tie-in with K-Tech? Mm -hmm. okay. What is the name of it again? Nip Tech, I think, is mm -hmm. the... North Idaho Professional Technical Ed. I mean, I think they still go by the old name, PT Professional oh. Technical instead of CTE. Yeah. But yeah, their foundation, right, made up of local people. Um, I yeah, yeah, I, I'm familiar with them. I, I, I had no idea we were paying dues to that group. I think it's school districts. I think it's all things like yeah. Kellogg and Wallace and Lakeland and. So it's a cooperative. Yeah, it's a cooperative. Yeah. But I think it's <coughs> all. Of school districts, I don't know if it's a foundation. And do we pay oh, yeah. a portion of the support for, for K Tech from the district here? Yeah. What does that amount to? Um, I actually had a note on that. What was that question about? How much do we pay for K Tech? We, we actually pay. <coughs> K Tech's going to be about 250000 next year. Okay, and we pay that over to the K Tech board for their. Correct. We yeah, quarter <coughs> we pay about 250. Post Falls pays a little over 300, and Coeur pays about 600. Um, and that's one of the bigger purchase services. And we 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 do they bill the invoices twice a year. So we just pay. And then that comes out as a general fund. Correct. A lot of good information there. This is why we're doing it, Absolutely. Mr. Jones. <clears throat> was a great idea somebody had. Let's, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. That's, uh, that's the uh, general fund fund balance. So if you look at the general fund fund balance, we actuals as we started the year at almost $7 million. 
6.9 and change. And it should have been 8% or whatever. Max 16%, yeah. Right, and it was actually right around 15.7. I, yeah, it was, it was right at 16. Right around 16. So this year I'm, so from that, if you take it, let's say round it to seven, that we started the year that I'm estimating and of course, you know, I always say when I make these estimates that the best thing is you know you're gonna be wrong when you make it because it's not gonna be exact. But I think, you know, it looks like, you know, we've been a couple million depending on the, you know, every month above uh, where we started, we're maintaining that. So we're estimating that we're gonna add from that start of seven, of actuals to we'll start the year when all is said and done with the audit at about nine and a half million, nine point four million eight hundred forty two. So we're about two and a half million. Right, which is correct. Is what we twenty four percent. Right. So if you look on the general fund <coughs> sheet, the just itself, if you went down a little bit. One, one more page down, was there? Which just looks there. So that on the revenue side there would be roughly a if you went a little higher up one more a liar there you go on the revenues the beginning balance there of 9.4 almost 9.5 that if let's say my number is dead on then we're right around 23 percent fund balance given our expenditures of 41 million our revenues our uh, the local tax revenue supplemental levy and tort levy um, a little bit of back taxes other local or some small dollars that come in some of those also the way we charge our ASB funds for yellow bus travel like reimburses um, so some of that is really accounting it's not really additional revenues um, state revenue of course is the uh, where the big dollars are, um, and our levy, of course, which is that 31 million, which is salary-based apportionment plus discretionary and some of the categorical funds that go into the general fund. But you know, the, the majority is uh, the state apportionment of discretionary and that. Um, our state funding, I'm estimating 239 funding units based on enrollment. So this year we earned 239 in, uh, in a decimal for salary based apportionment. So I'm sort of budgeting just flat. Since we have the enrollment rules there, I didn't, I could have maybe built budget 241, 242, a few more funding units, but I, I, I wanted to keep it at there. You don't count them until you see the white Right, mm -hmm. there you go. Yep. <clears throat> so we sort of kept it there. The and, and because I maintain that discretionary, or not the discretionary, the, that enrollment funding, I and mean, that really is you know, generating much more revenues, and, and that's good news. The other increase outside of enrollment is the, the state gave us, on the discretionary funding side, out of salary based apportionment, another $6,300 in discretionary funding on, on the unit price. It was 29,000, now it's 35 and change. Those dollars though, in the legislation were saying to be directed towards medical benefits, to try to get some of the districts over to the state plan. So we did, through negotiations, um, increase, you know, our enhance our benefit package and to approximate cost of 1.5 million and that's what that 6,000 is. So those dollars we sort of used as intended, not didn't hold them off for another use. Um, but that's where our really the increase in state funding is where our increase in funding is coming from enrollment plus that increase in medical. Um, for our expenditure side, and 
Well, I find, I guess, in the last revenue, there is a little bit of federal revenue on the federal E-rate program. That's all the other federal revenues go into the special revenue funds, but E-rate we, we've just kept into the, the general fund. Expenditure side, you can see that 36 of the 41 um, is salaries and benefits, and that really reflects our staffing levels right now, plus anticipated increased costs of, of the negotiated agreement um, of, as we work through IBB with the 4% raise, the increased medical and things like that. So this doesn't take into consideration any additional? We've had staff that we know are going to be there as far as, um, you know, like the uh, additional security personnel that we're adding, that's in budget, um, if we knew, but no, otherwise I, um, I've I've budgeted sort of our staffing level of right now, so if we had to add, um, let's say, eight teachers, I didn't put this in that budget. Um, <clears throat> but the people that we've hired already that you know about that are additional FTEs. Yeah, of course, those things that we knew were going to happen are, we've, we've done those, I've done those things, but let's say suddenly I don't know, a school grows, Lakeland High School has another 75 kids and they say we need two teachers, I, I didn't have that in there, I had their current staff. Or, or, a, or a position that was open that, you know, we, you know, Lisa had said, yes, we're, you know, we will fill this position is going to be coming next year, so have it in budget. So yeah, those are covered. And the, the three that Brooks sent over, the three new job descriptions, one's a tech position, and I think the other are counselor and um, special ed. Can't hear what is she talking about? I couldn't hear that. Sorry. Uh, does that include the three new positions that um, are possibly going to be added to the job descriptions? The tech person, another counselor, and then a special ed? teacher or something? Yes, we're, we're, yes, we're covering those things, yes. Yeah. It's just what's not covered is when we get to August and we have big enrollment increases because that's when registration happens, those are not covered. Supplies and materials line item at 1.6, uh, instructional supplies, does that also include uh, maintenance? Or we, yeah, the supplies and materials is we allocate as part of the sort of a building budget formula, about three hundred and seventy thousand dollars goes to the buildings. So, like John Brown has twenty thousand supplies, and the high school has more. They have about eighty thousand of supplies. So, to the ten buildings, about three seventy goes to the buildings as part of budget. Instructional materials, we've and this is what we budget this year. We've budgeted two hundred thousand dollars of a sort of a uh, curriculum, instructional materials budget. So there's been times where you, you add a kindergarten classroom and they need, you know, more kids and you needed to buy some of whatever the approved curriculum is that uh, uh, Dr. Pasley or uh, Superintendent Arnold can, you know, have resources to buy those materials. Um, so that's in budget. Um, yep, just out of that, um, when our science teachers need chemicals for chemistry lab or um, life, you know, frogs for the life science lab that we have. So there's this $100,000 for secondary instructional supplies and then 100000 for elementary and those go through Lynn and me. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's in this abbreviated form, the line item where the textbooks in the future would have to come into play. In other words, we don't have another resource to buy textbooks and yeah, well, the correct. And the, it, 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 we would need to beef this one up. So right, and you could correct. And so, <laughs> the, you know, approximately two hundred eighty thousand dollars goes to maintenance custodial supplies. Yeah. You know, just mm -hmm. paper, and then of course uh, some things in the general fund that maintenance purchases, filters, parts, supplies. That's ongoing. Um, we budget $25,000 a year for supplies for security. You know, we need a camera, if we need things for the security personnel, things like that. Um, I increased our budget this year 
for diesel one hundred thousand um, dollars, and I hope hope that's enough. I hope that's enough. Yeah. It's sort of hope crazy. We, hope we actually have but, diesel. They're but, actually uh, saying right now we. But might anyway, we did. I mean, so part of that one point six million three hundred thousand is just what we think diesel will cost next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of that. Um, and then there's one hundred twelve thousand of transportation parts. Um, you know, just the bus barn buying to keep our, our fleet going. And there's also, um, I don't have the dollar amount there on my notes, but um, it has to be, I can take a look, um, 25, 30, 40, I mean, there's, for athletic uniforms, supplies, those end up being part of that pot of supplies. So like the, the high schools have a fund to do helmet reconditioning to do a uniform rotation and those dollars are also part of that 1.6 million. So there's a lot of stuff that kind of gets stuck in. Yeah, it's sort of the, yeah, that those supplies and materials is sort of a big um, catch all of all those smaller purchases and we do use other funds for some of that but that's, the general fund really supports most of that. The three million of purchase services um, really the big ones are utilities are in that line item. Um, our special education students with disabilities purchase services. There, there's services that I mean, it's several, a couple hundred thousand dollars of, of of SLP or OTPT services, and that we don't have staff that you cover those needs to meet the needs of the IEP are there. Our, our phones. So, like our phone service, I actually budgeted a reduced cost this year because of as we move forward of this Ooh, um, Mr. Jones this summer but I did also budget part of supplies and materials I did budget the one-time cost of that 1.6 million as part of that is 65,000 for phones the one-time cost yeah. so um, you know other services you know snow plowing we budget about $125,000 a year for the contracted service for snow plowing uh, other maintenance services KTEC is a purchase service, so part of that $3 million is that two hundred fifty dollars or a little bit more going to KTEC. Athletic travel, so when you see all those uh, uh, purchase services for travel, that's part of that $3 million, those buses, that's part of that. Um, I have a solution. Officials, um, you know, we, we for the two high schools for officials, I think that's seventy five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year that you end up paying. And, um, you know, some of our software, Skyward, uh, you know, all those software subscriptions that you maintain are part of. Those are like the big ticket items in that purchase services line. How much do sports bring in every year? Sports I mean, stuff. Like, like gate money and <laughs> I, I, I SD no. cards. To us, nothing. No. <laughs> to the district. No. It goes, it goes, it goes right to well, the school. That's what I'm asking. Like all I school. could get those numbers. I don't have that I'm just right in front of me. Yeah, we could. I could certainly get well, the gate money. Yeah, it's kind of one of those school reports. If you look at those, we could get there. It's in this the past couple years, especially with COVID and now going that gates have been way down. I know when I've talked to the principals, um, but I could. I mean, if you want, this water. Yeah. Yeah, we can get that information for you. ASB. Uh, Fees get spread across all activities, so right. you know, drama gets a little bit, and FFA gets a little bit. Yeah, Gates gets a little bit. I mean, football, I think, is the big. I mean, they're the ones who get that, I and mean, that generates yeah. most of the gate for sure. And they weren't even allowing parents in the year before. So. Right. No, I, no, I get it. I was just I'm, wondering. I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing a cost-saving measure. Okay. Well, I have a little proposal. Uh, I actually printed out because I. I think it's sometimes easier for us to all be looking at the same piece of paper. Um, our athletic, our activities directors have been, we have really struggled this year with busing because of just our transportation. Our department is really struggling to, with busing. So um, Matt and um, Tim Cronley have been working together and we are, one of only a few districts in North Idaho who are not already doing this, but um, the proposal is to purchase 
They're called 15 pa passenger mini buses. <coughs> and um, we put on here some considerations for the board, but um, so some things that just have been recently occurring, um, because transportation is so tight, we've had situations where we had Timberlake High School softball girls were had to leave school at noon to go sit at Majestic Field for three hours to be there to be able to play their game. Otherwise, there was no transportation to get them there. So we've got kids losing out on a lot of instructional time. Um, can, can you explain the logistics of that? Or what, how, why? Um, why did that make sense? Because of our double routing, they, um, they have a small window of time when they, or they have only a certain number of drivers who are available. And so on that particular day, they, they couldn't get them there at when they needed to be there at 2.30 or whatever because they were running the route. So okay. they had to be able to drop them off early and they needed- To get back to do their route, okay. Yes. Okay. So we had a situation where Lakeland High School was asked to arrive at Timberlake High School at 12.30 for a four o'clock softball game for the same reason. And the coaches are asking the question, what in the world did we do with the girls for four and a half hours, three and a half hours? Mm -hmm. um, and and they're just, my biggest concern is they're missing out on instructional time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to, um, that, to Trustee Jones point earlier is that when we take kids to state, our board policy says that we're not using our yellow buses if we go more than a certain number of miles. So every time we go to Boise, we are um, hiring a, a charter. charter bus, mm -hmm. which is up to $8,000 for a round trip for one team. And Timberlake High School goes to state for just about everything. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge expense. Um, but a lot of our teams, are small enough that we could actually transport them on a, a 15 passenger minibus without having to pay the, that $8,000. Like, not the entire golf team doesn't go down to state. Only those who qualify. Right. Um, the, you know, the, I don't, the entire wrestling team doesn't necessarily always go because they have to qualify, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when we go down for basketball state, they're not taking varsity and JV, they're taking their team that's going to play. So we could significantly cut costs just in state travel. Um, but the bigger issue for us is just, um, we've just had so many situations and the, we're not, it's not <coughs> gonna get easier with bus drivers and, and our double routes are definitely causing problems for us. It, um, kind of the unintended consequence of trying to make things better. Uh, it's as far as activities goes, the double routing is really, really hard. Um, especially since we don't have a lot of extra drivers, we just barely have enough to run the routes that we have. So um, the minibus actually has seat belts, unlike regular yellow buses. Um, and, but because it's a 15 uh, passenger, um, we don't have to have a CDL. So as long as coaches were comfortable driving the buses, um, we wouldn't need a bus driver. Um, so there would be the upfront cost, and I did on the back. Um, we, we made some calls today actually trying to get some actual quotes, and you can't get anybody to talk to you, but um, when we did some just checking online, a new minibus for, spa for sale um, cost Fifty thousand dollars or more, and a used one is around twenty-five. So, um, Post Falls just bought, I think, two or three minibuses, and they bought used, um, and they um, they run great, and they they are very happy with them. But we've had to actually cancel activities, events for our kids because we can't either we can't get them there or we can't get them home. So, well, so you're how many? athletes or on a football team? Football we could not necessarily use for this. Okay. Um, we would have, there are some football, track, and um, Lakeland High School swim team would not fit on a 15 passenger bus. 
Okay, so these buses would be being purchased for sports that maintain a roster of 15 or less? For the tra for traveling. Mm -hmm. For traveling, yeah. Okay. Ideally, what they were saying, I mean, if you look, ideally we'd like to get to the point where we have two for each school because then we could potentially take too many buses with a, with a larger team and not have to charter a bus. However, when you have uh, dual sports, I mean, when you have sports, two, two different sports on one day, who takes precedence and how is that determined? Um, typically when, like if the girls basketball team is playing at home, the boys basketball team is playing away. So they try to kind of schedule it in that way. I mean, it doesn't but always happen that way. But like football and soccer in the fall. Right. How, who takes precedence? Uh, well, that's I mean, a good that's question. <laughs> I mean, but what it does do is it it's one less bus right that we're True. trying to get True. and that's what we're actually trying to alleviate is some pressure on the transportation department okay. Okay. so if we if our football team was going to uh, post falls mm -hmm. and the soccer team was <coughs> needing to go to kellogg um, so wouldn't football take a yellow bus anyways yeah, right because they're large football, football mm -hmm. so that wouldn't be an issue right, right. but so then um and volleyball um, we had I asked that question today said how you know what percentage are we talking is it like 50% of our teams and it, they just said it really depends on the event because some tournaments for volleyball they only take their varsity volleyball teams but if you're actually playing like Timberlake High School is going to Kellogg um, they take their JV and their varsity teams because they play back to back and so it just it's it um, it would be dependent on that but if we had two buses at each school in their in their minds we could take easily take both teams um, and then that's just one less team that the yellow buses have to transport would because I don't know um, I know like FFA competes mm -hmm. and I know they don't have well Timberlake may but I know Lakeland doesn't have at least I don't know from or I don't believe so from <laughs> when they're presented over 15 participants yes so and I don't be Utilizing something mm -hmm. like that. Yes, yeah, so it's okay. Uh, so it's definitely not just athletics. This um, okay. we def we we talked at length about okay. FFA, um, our drama club. Um, right. Say kiddos doing a <coughs> solo and BPA. Yeah. Um, uh, Student council. Chris Jarstead, when his go kids go to the Emmys over mm -hmm. in Seattle, um, they could use it. So there are lots of. It, it would it would definitely alleviate some stress on our transportation department. I think it would be less costly. Mm -hmm. um, and for sure, state, w we just wouldn't have to charter, I mean, for sure, we would definitely have to charter um, a bus for football. We can't. Right. With all their equipment and the, the large team, um, track, uh, but track actually for state, you have to place in order to go to state. They don't take the whole track team, so right. you could potentially use a white bus for that too. So yeah, I, did, I haven't added it up, but my guess is we put out enough for charter buses this year, not counting football, mm -hmm. uh, to pay for one of these buses. Oh yeah, yeah. easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they don't break down for eleven hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> That was terrible. <laughs> They're not guaranteed not to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, the, and it would help us to not have our kids missing quite so much school. No, I would agree with that. Did, did I hear you say that uh, Post Falls bought used buses? Mm -hmm. where, where did they get those, do you know? Um, I, uh, Matt tried to call the transportation director today to find out, or the athletic director to find out and he hadn't heard back, um, but uh, Western... Western Bus Sales? Yes, in Nampa is the name that we were So getting. they're one of the, yeah. they're, they're actually a school bus vendor also. Right, right. So they must, I, they went to Western or Harlow's, it might be, you can actually... Well, it's not the one that messed up. Bryson, yeah. <laughs> well, depending on the uh, cost of them, um, if, if you did one of, Time, I mean, used ones. You, you could just. I mean, if they're going to be twenty-five thousand a piece, you could just get three quotes and be within bid bid law. If mm -hmm. it got above a hundred thousand of a total order, then you have to be more formal. But you, if you just got a couple, you would be under that 
unused ones, it looks like. And, and I was really specific when I called this a 15 passenger mini bus because our iCramp insurance will cover buses. They are, they are not in favor of us driving vans for whatever reason. Um, I guess so schools I, and buses go together. iCramp would be okay with this? Yes, because uh, they, Post Falls did their. their they are asking, and iCramp is the first time I, I mentioned this uh, on our renewal. Where they asked if you had any vehicles like this where they didn't ask before so definitely more districts are doing it my guess is they're probably will factor that into your rates um something happened i don't know the history behind it it's definitely there was an accident somewhere in the state of idaho many years ago with like an athletic van mm -hmm. because the practice in the state nobody was doing it anymore so I'm guessing that's what happened um, because when I was working for some Washington districts we had like a, a 16 passenger van for like the golf team you know bec you know and it was sort of a more standard practice and when when I first started working for Coeur d'Alene and I looked at sort of the same thing and and I was you know talked to insurance, talked to other business managers, talked to other soups, and they went, oh, nobody does that. But I think now with the um, increased travel of the north to the south and some of those costs, and really you're looking at... I'm just a struggle I, to retain bus drivers. I, we don't have you done. You can't do yellow bus travel and, and that, but you still want to provide this that, you know, sometimes you have to say this is a good option and... Uh, and there are, you know, there's no perfect solution, right? But that uh, it, it can be a good way to help the program. So, a couple other questions related to this: Do we get any reimbursement through IHSAA for travel costs? No. No. And no. There's an undue burden on the northern schools and, because and of the way they. That goes to my state. second question: Do they do they have an honest rotation of location? No. 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 See, we, we gotta <laughs> deal with that. We gotta We've tried. That. They just. They we ignore have, everything we the lost the population know, percentage up there, here and so at one time we finally prevailed and got mm -hmm. a fairly decent rotation. It wasn't a totally even rotation, but it was better than used I think that I was, it's a constant problem, I know. Yeah. And you know, if we're not getting any reimbursement and we're expected to travel from here to Boise or Pocatello constantly, the hardship is on us in terms right. of cost. That's why we're running into some of this stuff. Right. And there's no there's no reimbursement from the state for any kind of athletics or activities well, I know other than from transportation. But they did have. You could like there what used to be at IHSAA. Oh, oh I, that I don't know. I we definitely not anymore. <laughs> uh, I can tell you not since I've been here have I gotten a check. So from IHSAA. when they hold a state tournament, they collect mm -hmm. all the all the gate and keep it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know, they might share some. If, if some does come back, it doesn't come at the district level, it'd come back to like high, Timberlake High School or Lakeland High School if, if they have getting some revenues at that level. I don't yeah, know. I, I, I don't I've do never heard I don't think it's significant. Uh, probably not, but when you stop and think about that, they hold a, a, a tournament at the Idaho Center, that one over at mm -hmm. Napa, uh, whatever. That's a huge tournament and they take in Boku bucks you don't go to those tournaments for nothing right and I guess uh, the question it begs the question what does the IHSA do with all that money because that's they're not that big an organization in terms of you know personnel costs and things like that yeah, I do not know not only that but they often have sponsors for those tournaments who also pay uh -huh. I know Darren yeah mm -hmm. I can. I will. So, uh, I can worthy, follow up. It's worthy of some investigation. I'll follow up with the two ADs and just see <laughs> what they well, do. Do. Well, they do. They do have girls softball every single game when they yeah. 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 Didn't they have volleyball state up here this year no. in Coeur d'Alene? But not for our schools. Oh, it was right. different. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, maybe it wasn't. I don't. I don't think our team. Maybe it was Flurry. I thought they tried. She used to wrestle in Boise. Yeah. Or not Boise. We went big argument one Moscow. time in the, in the past, and they finally agreed to allow the lesser tournament, the lesser sport tournaments, to be up here right. as long as football and basketball and everything was down south. But 
And it's not a, not an equitable situation. Yeah, and what sticks in my head is I think that they the agreement was that like every three years yeah, something would come up here. Um, but for some yeah, sport. sports, sports, but never <laughs> never basketball. Uh, right. Well, well the argument is they don't have a facility big enough to handle the tournament up here. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the argument. So I, but I will follow up and ask um, what IHSA does with the gate money from state tournaments. Does that get distributed back to schools? And what does that look like? I don't know the answer to that. You know, because of the right thing to do, I'm talking about the right thing to do would be to support those schools who have to travel long distance to those tournaments. Mm -hmm. Right, right, because not only are we paying for the, the eight thousand dollars for the charter bus? But then we have to pay hotel costs yeah. and per diem for our kids to eat while they're gone. Yeah, absolutely. And the kids who live in Boise and are playing in Boise get to go home and sleep in their own bed at night, mm -hmm. and they get a home cooked meal, and you know, they're not eating at McDonald's. <coughs> right. So there, yeah, there's definitely a disadvantage for North Idaho schools. Who's uh, who's the district one rep for IHSAA? Mm -hmm. Someone from Coeur d'Alene? Um, it could be Lisa. It is not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I but that's the person that's going to have to instigate some real movement. Uh, it used to be Bob Rannells. Yeah. And then he's retired now, and I don't know who took his spot. Right. So I'll find out. So, you know, anyway, I would favor doing this at some point with many buses. Okay, so I will um, just uh, work with our clerk and the board chair to um, find a, an agenda where um, <laughs> there's a little bit of room. <laughs> some room. And um, obviously, the problem is that we spend fifty or hundred thousand dollars on this. You're not going to have that available else. for some other project, but because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a capital outlay item. Right. Mm -hmm. But it will help us. It could offset some of the money that Brian has budgeted in the Travel supplies and, ma and materials or purchase services costs in the general fund, because we're not going to pay eight thousand dollars to send our golf two two the golf kids to bus, um, yeah. Boise. We could offset it completely in one year. Mm -hmm. I would also just, because I come from the transportation world, to um, reach out to the mechanics and check to see what, how will this affect them in regards to backlogging of parts and repairs. You know, vehicles break down, so especially if you get a used vehicle. You know what is that going to look like for them? You know, as far as how much money are they going to have to put forth in supplying their parts? You know, division. Thank you. Yep. Parts. We'll touch base parts. with them and let them know kind of what we're thinking and get some input from them. Okay. I show district secretaries for District One is Larry Schwenke, S C H W E N. Oh, it's Coeur d'Alene. It's Coeur d'Alene. Yep. So it's District mm -hmm. One. Yeah. That's not what I think. Didn't he just retire? Didn't Larry just retire? I think he did. Come yeah, I don't. I think that might be a little bit out to date, but it might be right. I thought he just retired either this year or last year. Might maybe it was this year. I thought it was in paper, but maybe it was this year. So maybe he is, but thought not much longer. No, because I remember his talk with him. Yeah. So when I bring this action item, um, what is your pleasure? I, I think the best way to mitigate the, the pressure on the transportation department would be two buses at each school. And if we did use, so be a, that would be $100,000. Or would you prefer that I come to you requesting just one bus? That's at assuming each. you could uh, get them for 0.5 mm -hmm. or less. Yeah. But if, we, if we were to purchase three, you'd have one for each school and one could rotate the, the, the to booster meet. clubs are already talking about wrapping the buses and making them, you know, deck them out. Oh. Well, they would each have they would each have one, and then to one start with, just and then LJS one to be float to be used. <laughs> yeah, that's between yeah between 
And we'd be under the hundred thousand. Okay, and then so we have the money to buy a, a fourth one, then they they each have later. Okay, so I, for three buses. Thank you. He's gone. Done. <laughs> so yeah. this is from 2020 to 2023. Yeah, well, he just he's going to okay. moving to Lewiston. Okay, well, this is silly. <laughs> but he's currently there just... right now, so he... so there's going to be a vacancy. Um, I hired somebody. Oh, I am so not taking that position. No. <laughs> <She's> like, uh -uh. <laughs> I, I like talking about academics. I don't enjoy. Oh, athletics is so much fun. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, we spend so much time talking about athletics. So, um, yeah, I, I am that. excited that uh, this will be available for our activities groups too. So we still need to talk about Which one the fund analysis. Yes, we do. So I knew that, you know, I anticipate the fund balance is there, um, but I, you know, showing what I think we would have, but I didn't designate any of that for any projects or anything. And Hayden Ross has uh, counseled us every year during the audit that, in their opinion, the fund balance is at the minimum, even at 16%. Correct. Yeah, that's been there. Yeah, the G every year we've heard that. From yeah, you. that's the GFOA's that's recommendation. That's the auditors you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, auditors are ultra conservative in that respect, so. Yeah. Give us a give us a window. Um, how much of uh, the projected uh, fund balance, if we were at eight percent, how much if we are at sixteen percent, and how much above sixteen percent in dollars? Well, sixteen percent is where we were last year, roughly. So and was it's that based seven? on revenues. Seven something. Yeah, I mean, so if you. Thought, I'd like to see us anytime we do go end the year over the the recommended sixteen percent that that money gets put into a replacement fund. I like that idea a lot. And that's how we build our replacement fund. Is anytime you know just have it in a literally in a policy, a fund balance policy that says anytime we are over this is what we do with those funds, and it happens automatically. I mean, of course, it has to be board approval that it, but I, that's my suggestion. So if we were to follow well, the suggestion, how many dollars are we talking about this year? It's like two about million. 7%. So it's like two million for, dollars. yeah, I mean, effectively, if you take 16% times, 41, 375, 674, 6.8 million. So depending where it's so around, roughly where we started this year is right around 16% with our current expenditures. Obviously that number changes every year based on your ex anticipated expenditures. So we were at 6.99 or whatever million. So 7 million, which So we were a little bit above that 16% at the start at the 7 million mark at the start of last year yeah. but based on budget with additional expenditures with the increase to medical costs and salaries and benefits you know that it's a the number changes every year sure mm -hmm. I understand so, that. right. but that's a 2.84 million dollar difference mm -hmm. see that 9.84 Beginning fund balance up at the top. Nine point four. So are, I mean, nine are, point are you four. saying that that it should be two seven. million dollars is above the sixteen percent level yeah, two, for this budget? Two point Correct. Two point De depending four on where we where end we up with our end. where we actually end, and we you know the yeah. final tally will be in October with the audit. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's my our, estimate. In terms of our budget work at this point, if we were to set aside two million dollars of that projected fund balance into your account, then you'd have that money for capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. Junior high doors. Mm -hmm. Brian, what I'd like to know is 
with respect to the growth getting up to where we're so are we at we're at 23.06 percent okay that's an estimate of that's where we will start <clears throat> the new year right yeah. okay respecting it's an estimate what the growth from 16 to 23 where did all those monies come from was it just ESSER money or was it it was other? the two factors were we did you know take advantage of some of those ESSER dollars right the second that. one was we built this year's budget on attendance okay and they changed the rule mid-year and allowed us to do enrollment okay that gave us over if we would have stayed on <clears throat> attendance reporting and I looked at our revenues with our we would only had 213 units we probably would have been in the hole this year seven hundred thousand okay. dollars if we kept with ADA with the enrollment that was like an additional three million dollars of revenues and that's helping us have this two point five million dollar Okay. Because remember, Brian also wrote the budget this for this year to to dip into the fund balance five hundred thousand dollars. So we didn't right. I knew so, when yeah. it was initially proposed. Some of those, right? So really, that I mean, the big the biggest factor, and especially ongoing for mm -hmm. being healthy, was really that enrollment rule. If they do backtrack on that, that would. Um, we may have, have to we may have to adjust what we're doing at the building level or even I mean with staffing honestly if that happened but I don't think that's going to happen but I mean, wish I had a crystal ball so based on our discussion uh, up to this point if we were just to take the round figure it actually needs to be about two and a half million doesn't it mm -hmm. off of that fund balance transfer it We've already discussed the fact that we'll gain about a million dollars because of what we're talking about with ESSER funds. Potentially the salary. With the offset there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would still be at the 16% level plus headed mm -hmm. toward next year. Mm -hmm. So two and a half is not unrealistic. Yep. Or maybe even a little more. What are we doing with the unappropriated funds and all the other funds? Well, that's so, that's the thing is we we should have a policy for each fund when we have well that well many of those funds of, uh, of what happens with those funds. Some of them you can't do. Yeah, that. some of those they're special revenue funds and they have to stay within those. So if you and we could go each by one, but all the federal dollars have to stay in the federal funds. Right. Um, but there was 189,000 and 372,000 specifically that Brian pointed out which equals 561,000 that Brian said we could use for capital projects that right. could that so so that's no I hear you we just have in the unappropriated balances 9,735,637 for uh, the proposed budget for the general fund, and then we have three million three hundred eighty-six thousand eight seventy-seven of unappropriated balances <coughs> in the all other funds. Right. Correct. So, so where those dollars are, mm -hmm. the big ones. Is first, we talked about the plant facility fund. One million of that three million is part of that line okay. that we're starting with, okay. even though we sort of. So there, the, there. that's why I don't like the state farm. They use unappropriated fund. Um, there's better reporting that you know you have what your fund balance is at the start and instead of call it unappropriate you might have it committed assigned reserved there's In income restricted um, there's different accounting terms that I think better but regardless given that form we have a million in the plant facility fund that we're gonna start July 1 with and spend it down most of it over the summer Okay. And that gives us that hundred and eighty. We have six hundred and seventy two thousand in the bus fund, but you know, four hundred and twenty of that is sort of dedicated for the buses that should arrive in August. We have the other fund that has a, a balance is our our debt service fund, mm -hmm. which is where we're making our final payments on our effectively our mortgage, our last bonds. 
And we're going to start the year with $2 million in our debt service fund. Um, and we will have, we'll collect about $970,000 of revenues. Our, we're going to have $1.5 million in payments, so that $2 million fund balance so next year is going to go down to $1.5. Um, we'll have one more year of collections about the same thing, and then our bonds will be paid off. Mm -hmm. So we're we're whittling that fund is we're collecting less than what our mortgage payment is right now because we have that balance. And so some of those other funds you see are, are those dollars. They're already appropriated for something. I, I guess I'm not following you because I do see the debt retirement on here for the 1.468. Yeah, on its own line item. Correct. That's the expenditure. We're right. starting, if you look on this page, the debt, the debt service fund itself, the start balance is at, we're at, I'm estimating to, to start at about <coughs> $2 million that will be in there. Because our, our $1.5 million payment is due in August. So we have to have that money because we don't collect the property taxes in time. <coughs> so there's a, it's a cash flow issue. So we have to have those monies collected. We will then make that payment. Then about the same time we're making that payment and literally right doing the wire transfer, we collect additional property taxes, half of them from June in the summer, and then the other half come in when people pay in January. And so then we'll end the year with about 1.5 million and again have enough to make that payment the next year and then we're almost done with our we will our bonds will be wrapping up in 2024-2025. So then what you're if I'm hearing you correctly what you're saying to bring that debt retirement on the proposed budget down to 1.468 you are taking the funds out of the unappropriated balance that's under all other funds to do that? It's part, no. All other funds just includes all these other funds combined together. Okay. So debt service is part of that. It's one of the other funds. Even and though it's its own line item. The only reason it has its own line item is that on the expenditure side, the expenditure of debt is a different iFarms code than any other expenditure and that's why it shows up by itself. So the state asks us that when you officially are doing principal and interest on voted debt that that is coded differently so that's why it shows up differently than any other expenditure. So it is part of the expenditures in the debt service fund. That 1.468, that's not that's, it's just an expenditure. It's a big expenditure, but that's what it is. And it's its own line by the state form. That's where it goes. So you can see that debt retirement is object number 600. The only objects in 600 in the way we code expenditures is debt retirement. So that's, where it, that's why it's its own line because that's how the state asks us to do the accounting. Right, but my question to you was, I know there's there's a word thing that you think it should be labeled something else, but we have 3,386,877 in unappropriated balances on the proposed budget for all of their funds. Oh, that would be that unappropriated balances at the end uh -huh. is going to be at the end of the year how much money will be left based on this budget in all those other funds. So if you look, our beginning balance is $6.2 million on all other funds. So if you took all our other funds right now, or at least my estimate, that we have actually 6.2. At the end of the year, we're going to have 3.3. So we're actually spending $3 million more than we're taking in in other funds next year. That's what that represents. So that, first, that beginning balance is the start 
if you want to save the start of the inappropriate funds, it's your, it's your fund balance of all those other funds. And we're going to end at 3.3 because, for example, we're going to spend a million dollars in the plant facility fund but have no revenues because we already have the money there. So those funds are spent but we have no revenues, so that's why those balances will be going down. Okay. I think I understand what you're saying. <laughs> well, and these are the, you know, these aren't my favorite forms. They're the, they're the state required fund like this. We have to send into the state the second one with the blue. Mm -hmm. I mean that. It, no, and, right. and I, I get. And that. I know because I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I just, I, I mean, I don't. You could create your own little form. It doesn't have to be a state form. It's easy for people like me to understand <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> well and that's why I tried to break it down with each one saying this is where we're starting and this is where we'll end so you basically start out the year with the beginning balances you know you have a series of revenues that come in and a series of expenditures that go out and the difference between beginning revenue and revenue taken in less the expenditures is at 3.3 for all funds. Your question is what's in that 3.3? Or why did we? My question is, is it appears that we have, based on the general fund, when you come down to unappropriated balances, that in a sense, we're not using the right language, is leftover money or money that's increasing yeah, it's the where we're at. It's, it's, fund yes. <clears throat> so the three million three eight six to me is 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 a parallel. But what I hear him saying is out of all of all the other funds at the end of the year, we're gonna end with the three million three eight six. So that I understand. And okay. some of those dollars are actually encumbered and just haven't been spent yet. Right. Well, or we're, we're starting. We're starting at six for other funds. What we're looking at the funds. We're we're starting at six point two, and that's our beginning balance of all those other funds. Right. And when all those other funds, when we spend down, assuming they come in, we're going to end at three point three. So we're actually spending more than we're taking in. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So that's what that shows. So that unappropriated balance, as opposed to using that term with the state firm, we could call it end balance. In fact, that's I've, I, I try to do that on these ones. I, I call it the total ending fund balance. Okay. And so, for example, in the debt service fund, we're starting with two million. We're going to bring in nine hundred seventy-one thousand. So we have available just a little over three million dollars when you add the revenues. But with our debt service payment of 1.468 million, we're going to take in $500,000 less than what we spent. We're, so we'll still end at 1.5 million and still, but we're starting effectively our, our account to pay our mortgage is starting to, to, to go down. Dwindle down. Dwindle down as, as, our, as our obligations for that mortgage go away. And, and what's you know difficult to understand is when you're looking at the other funds. I don't know how many we got. 10, 12, 15? <laughs> we have. And oh, each, each one of those will have a little bit of an ending balance. And the and the debt services one. I think yeah. Brian, you were saying we have to keep a larger fund balance there because of the cash flow issue. So mm -hmm. we can't spend that three point. However, we need to have that there. Right. Yeah which this year we started the all other funds with 6.2 next year we'll start the fund balance or the all other funds with 3.36 if we're spending 12 million 287 because we're incoming 15 million we're, we're expending 12 million yeah, we have a real quick count, like 20 other funds outside the general fund. 
Yeah, that's a bunch to do that. I never counted them up, but they've been, you know, every time some of these federal programs they add a new fund for it and then the state, state categorical the funds. state categorical funds like state technology they wanted in its own fund out of the general fund and literacy, uh, literacy is out of the general fund that they wanted that so they keep creating these a lot of the funds. Because there are reports tied to the money that comes from the mm -hmm. state. We're running out of numbers actually they the way they they've done it we they're going to have to they might have to go to instead of yeah, they're going to have to add a digit if they keep adding funds. All right. Everybody's heads are hurting, I can tell. <laughs> so, can I ask you a question, Trustee Bain? Maybe. <laughs> um, do I have the answer? <laughs> well, just I'm based on yeah. your suggestion mm -hmm. about adding language to the policy, um, would it be prudent for Brian to show in the budget a transfer of the money you're talking about to a, an account for capital projects so that we're in line with what you're wanting to do? Or is he okay to leave the budget the way it's written, showing the, the, the larger fund balance? It seems more transparent to me that we make that decision and and the budget that the board mm -hmm. approves on the 15th reflects that desire. The thing is we don't we aren't going to know what that amount <clears throat> I mean yeah. we can do the proposed amount but we don't know what that amount's going to What if you That's the problem percentage. with having a policy is mm -hmm. policies in effect but you don't know what the answer to it is and so right. almost year by year you can establish a, a precedent, I guess, uh, right. by doing what we're talking about doing here. It, it would show capacity and budget for it, and yeah. then mm -hmm. um, yeah. certainly could, often on some type of these transfers or big ones, um, for example, when the board approves us, we've traditionally transferred 225000 from the plant facility fund to the bus fund just to keep buying some buses. Mm -hmm. The board sees that at budget and so we haven't gone back to the board asking for the transfer because the budget was approved. But something big like what you're talking about, you know, certainly could be an action item or coming to the board saying that here is where we ended budget, let's say for argument's sake we budgeted two million dollars mm -hmm. and let's say it came into 2.35. Certainly, the, I mean budget it's never going to be exact, right? But you you sort of have it, and so actuals would vary a little bit different than budget, but it'd be more in the ballpark. Right, and this is going to be an end of end of year transfer rather than beginning of the next year. So that would be October yeah, after the audit. Yes. So we could have an action item. Well, I don't know that it well, would even need to be after the audit. I mean, you're going to. Well, it wouldn't be. I mean, at that point, since. Probably some of the big projects you're doing aren't going to hit until, honestly, a little later in the year. When you made the transfer, if you did it next year, that would be yeah. fine. Yes. Yeah. But what if they, they, what if the board wanted to? Sorry. What if the board wanted to um, make the decision to fix the doors at Lakeland Middle School now? Do you just authorize the use of the fund balance? Mm -hmm. Is how you would do that? Well, you would. You would. You. I mean, that's not going to be our only capital expenditure no, funding is. either that's more going to be stuff you know my thought is replacement <coughs> for facilities or um, yeah, so you're thinking I, I instead think of a bond be, you're thinking building a fund to well, I don't think that it's a bad idea to, to, okay to, I mean, sorry I thought you were thinking no, it's, about it could maintenance we can do it either way it's not um, I, don't know. I, I just think we would be more transparent with the public on two counts. One is if we make the transfer, for example, when we get to this point and we have a firm look at the budget, let's say we transfer 2.75 million. Now, at least with the projections we have, that's going to put us under the 16% mark. So in terms of transparency to the public, that item is taken care of. In other words, we're not going to show a fund balance that exceeds our policy mm -hmm. when the thing gets published, 
right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the money in the fund that you're talking about, and we can expend out of that fund as we mm -hmm. feel the need as we go forward. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So those are the two issues that I see there. So you are suggesting that we transfer that in, in June. So, so that you're approving a budget that doesn't show the large exactly. fund balance. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So that we're staying within our with policy. As long as you're that not says. jeopardizing, you know, your your yes. total yes. fund balance. Yeah. Well, no, and, and you definitely are still within your policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, well, even if you left it there and transferred later. What the policy says is that if you get above that, the board should use those funds for one-time expenditures. So by if even if you do the transfer when you later when the audit comes in and it's in budget with a a transfer line item of let's say 2.75 as a budgeted transfer number, and then when you know what it is, you do the actuals. You are following your policy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, never there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I. I'm thinking back to when Dave was out campaigning and he said, how come that fund balance is as big as it is when it exceeds the board's policy? And so, you know, how do you have an answer for that unless you do something which is fairly straightforward and concrete? And I guess that's, that's where I'm headed. Well, at some point it might exceed the board policy, but typically what happens come August, that won't be the case. In fact, last year we ran a huge deficit, um, <coughs> a couple million dollars, I think it was last year, my <coughs> year before. Um, so that's it. But I have a question. The 23.06%, um, Rosanna, can you mm -hmm. um, scroll? scroll. Yeah, yeah, right, right there. there. So where is that percentage coming from? How is that calculated? The it should be uh, the beginning fund balance divided by anticipated expenditures of the 41, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, 7. Oh, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so the 2306, at the, uh, the 9, 4, 8, 4, 5, and the 23 percent, how did the 23 percent get calculated? The, the 9,484,000 divided by the 41,124,000. Right. Is 23. Is 23.06, oh. and then the 23.67 is the ending fund balance of 9735637 divided by the same expenditure right. amount, as a guess. That, that was the question that was trying to be answered a little okay. while ago. Yeah. I was a little lost. Sure. I mentioned that. Okay. It's my new math calculation. <laughs> <laughs> So I knew I wasn't doing something right. I just couldn't quite figure it out. Okay. Inhales. <laughs> well, you know, we were sitting in that one class learning about math. <laughs> <laughs> that it? No, it's never oh. it. Oh. <laughs> Just wander. <laughs> don't you? You don't love hanging out with us. I yet? do. I just like my house. <laughs> <laughs> you can be both. Do. <laughs> Maybe we can set it up with your recliner in here. For the Zoom me in. <laughs> it sucks. It, it it it's not fun to be no, being on the only phone person. Was awful. I got not hear half of what you guys were saying. Yeah. It's just harder to interact when you're mm -hmm. face to face. And obviously, everything we've tentatively agreed to in the negotiated agreement is encompassed into the budget that he's laid it out. Yeah, as I was trying to estimate salaries and benefits, I mean, some of that is your best guess. There's a lot of moving factors with, I mean, the people who are in the seats right now, if, they, if everybody stayed and didn't retire, resign, or and we, we added no new people, then it's a lot easier. But obviously, some of that I use averages on some of the, so we know we're having you know some, you know some attrition and some people leaving for resigning and or, you know, put in their time and they're retiring. Um, so a lot I will just use an average or average teacher 
we might hire a, a you know sometimes you do hire a veteran and they're high on the salary schedule sometimes you hire a, a beginning teacher and they're low so I, I sort of try to it sort of averages out in the in the big picture um, you know ironically and then see that affects our revenues because our revenues part of you know the formula is the more experienced teachers you have they they're higher on the curve ladder salary schedule which we get paid off of so you get you earn more dollars um, so they're actually and it's just that's why form you know formulas and people get confused so people will say sometimes like well you hired um, some new teachers but that's okay because you can get reimbursed from the state from them and so there's no cost yeah. actually <laughs> you can hire new teachers and have more teachers on staff and you get less money because they pay you on a weighted average and so now I've added three let's say new teachers and they're at the lower end they lowered my weighted average I get funded by how many teachers based on student enrollment it's just a number so if I have more teachers than what the state funds anyway I actually can get my weighted average I actually make less money even though we hire three new teachers it's actually a loss well the way the formula works it it doesn't seem right but that's how it's a formula it's explain weighted average so the a if a teacher um, is a first year teacher and they are on the career ladder, I think the beginning salary funded for a beginning teacher is forty two thousand five hundred. <laughs> let's say it's forty two thousand five hundred. Okay. It's a right around there. Okay. It might be forty three oh three hundred, but forty two thousand five hundred. If you're at the top of the career ladder, you're getting about fifty five thousand. So, so the state salary schedule for that individual. So if we only have two teachers and one was 42.55, what they're gonna fund me is the average of those two. Okay. So we have 290 teachers, it's the average of all those teachers of where they land on the, on the career ladder. Okay. Um, and and that's, that's the number. So part of estimating the revenues is you take your staff and you think where do you think they're going to land on the career ladder and then on the staff that there's attrition you know I sort of take them off the board and then I just I put a few in the beginning a few a few in the middle and a few in the experience a little more in the beginning because that seems to be what we're getting um, and then you're missing a little bit on the low side mm -hmm. which is better but it still is you know, an educated guess. Okay, thank you. Well, in looking at the seller schedule, because that was attached as well, um, I am curious, what is a, what is the difference from this uh, shadow mm -hmm. salary scale and then the salary scale. I mean, what's there was a a couple years ago. So there's an aspect of and 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 Brooke might be able to explain it better. But I'll do my first shot and then we'll go from there. So there's part of Idaho law mm -hmm. is that if on a teacher's primary base contract, and if they are an experienced teacher, that they have a continuing contract, they're past their probationary status, so usually year four. Mm -hmm. that if if our contract with them it's not what we get funded but our contract with them was fifty thousand dollars the next year we cannot pay them 49 we have to pay them at least what they earned the previous year that's state law okay it's called property rights okay. another aspect of the law is that they wrote in legislation is that there's a, a minimum of what you can pay a teacher mm -hmm. so the salary schedule for the career ladder now so there's a state minimum so that our I can't have my teacher start at 35 but the state give me 42.5 for a first year teacher mm -hmm. I have to at least give them the 42.5 right 42 120 42 and so with the career ladder you have 
what they call the residency ladder, residency rung, and professional rung, and now advanced professional rung. And you're a, you're a step one, two, three, then you're step one, two, three, four, five on the, mm -hmm. on the professional. So when the, this legislation came out a couple years ago when they, on some of the career ladder, they had also a minimum that if you're on the professional rung, you had to pay that minimum. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened to us is let's say that we had a first year teacher who comes from out of state and has professional experience, I don't know, and, but we ended up having to pay them that. There was, I mean, we had like a, a, the, the Anderson Julian Hull attorneys given a recommendation saying that if you have someone who's professional status, you gotta pay them the second minimum, the higher. And I'll let Berg, I'm not explaining it well. I'm so, sorry. yeah, okay. when we started this a few years ago in the career ladder, it came out in law, and I think I cited the statute on that um, mm -hmm. schedule in there. Um, we do have a few people, um, our salary schedule wasn't on that upper left-hand corner, wasn't anywhere near where it was supposed to be when they did this career ladder. They had made a significant increase in those cells. So we have people that if they hit their fourth year and were in a professional rung, the minimum that they could make, for example, this year, effective uh, July 2022, is 43488 is the very minimum that they can make. But if you look at our regular schedule, we're not there yet. We haven't caught up based off of the COLAs. So we have to do that shadow. And then the rest of the cells, if you look at the rest of the cells, they're comparable yeah. to the other one. So once they fall off of that, then they move over to the regular schedule until we can get caught up. And we're hoping maybe we'll be caught up maybe within the next year or two. I don't know, depending on what our COLAs are. Then we can get rid of that shadow schedule. Does that help? Okay, so in those first... Go ahead. In, in those first uh, eight cells, where the number's all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to pay the teacher according to the shadow. Mm, yeah, according to the state statute, yeah. yeah. And, and, and over time, the thing will ripple up. Yeah. And it should go away. Consistent. Yeah, it was really, so we ended up having teachers the year that it happened who, who because they, they were only, we were paying them as a, as a bachelor, a BA bachelor's with one year experience on our salary schedule. But because maybe they went, came from out of state. No, it was I, just, it was just because this, our, our schedule up schedule. in that upper left hand was, was lower than, and then all of a sudden the state did this big mm -hmm. jump and that got, remember that got some of the veteran people feathers all ruffled up. And so that's when we went into IBB the next year and we um, ended up giving them a little bit more of a boost in that right-hand corner because the, the state had funded so much in that upper left-hand corner. So basically, it's, what this is is just allowing us to catch up to the state minimum requirements if you there are on a professional run. So prior to that, the other thing that kind of exacerbated all of this is that our, our old salary schedule um, had like cells where for three years you stayed at the same rate, especially at the top right hand, left hand corner. And, um, and, and then through the recession, this district chose not to riff anybody. Instead, they chose to just freeze everybody on the salary schedule and not, not let people step down or move over um, or increase the salary. That was how we kept, we maintained our full staff. So through the recession, we had teachers who were in that that same cell, and it and they because they didn't get to step, they actually ended up. Some of them were in there five and six years, and because by the time they we unfroze the salary schedule and they got to start stepping down, they still had to get. It was three years in that same cell, and so um, 
when we put the money into unfreezing, we couldn't do a lot with the salaries at the top end, um, just because of the cost of, of moving everybody. So um, their focus was just on, on the steps and lanes. So, so if, if you hire a, a teacher uh, coming into the district on, let's say, step three of the BA column, but this thing doesn't ripple that far in the next year, or are they still at that, and when they go to step four, it's the same dollar amount, so are they at the same dollar amount year after year in that instance? Okay, so let's say I have a person that comes in and they're at a BA step three, right. but they're only an R3. Do you see a res they have a residential three, so they essentially they're going to be residential on rung or on, on rung third. residential three. Yeah. They would remain on the regular schedule because we're above the residency fund. Mm -hmm. So, but let's say I have somebody that has um, comes in and they have uh, four years of experience and they're a professional one according to the state then I'm going to have to put them on that shadow schedule because the minimum amount I can pay them is that 43 something. I can't pay them what is up in our upper left hand. So we just we have to wait for we just have to wait for it to catch up. That's all. So there was debates on do you have to do that or you can say no we're just paying the state minimum. And there was you know information back that the legislature said no. We never intended to keep to to have two minimums because that's effectively what happened. There's a residency minimum mm -hmm. and a professional mm -hmm. one minimum now. And they said we never intended that, but regardless, and there's after, an advanced. If at, you look, if you look at the career ladder, if the attorneys looked at it, that's what we there got. is minimums that you can pay for your residential and for your professional and for your advanced professional. So is that, is that on the sheet? There is, if you look up Idaho State Statute, um, Title 33, Chapter 10, it's Title 33, 1004B. But there, there's not a whole lot of people on the I shadow schedule, and we should outgrow it in a couple years. Keep trying, it'll work eventually. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand it. It's sort of, yeah. So when we first went to it, yeah, you could have a teacher that was on the shadow schedule and they go down and they they would stay the same stay the same that was that was my question correct they could but if the state changes the minimum the minimum then, then we could, reflect that change yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's 30, 33 1004b but they theoretically could get caught in the minimum until <coughs> right or they go get 12 credits, they move across on our Cyrus schedule and they're out of it. Then they'll get a little more. So Correct. if you scroll down, right. in, in the, it's like towards the middle of the statute. Residency professional advanced. Yeah. They're starting. Exactly. So the okay. July 1, it's uh, the professional is kind of where we had the issue because we, we fund above the residential, as you can see. Okay, so we're above that. But we weren't above the professional. Just scroll down. Okay. So that's why we have that. Just scroll down. Yeah, just scroll there, you down. Okay. there you go. A little bit higher up. Nope, down, sorry. So you can see, yeah, all of those. It's that block that we're looking at. <coughs> yeah, because there's a lot of confusion um, as to what Lakeland's paying because people are bringing up our pay scale and saying, well, I'm not going to go there for four years at 40,000. I just had this conversation with somebody and I said, no, we we don't pay that. And uh, they're like, yeah, I just looked at the website. It's only 40,000. I'm like, no. Well, and so it does. It depends on no. what, how, where they're placed. Like if they're fresh out of college, I mean, so the old one. This was somebody with experience nearly five years and they're no. like, I'm not applying there. It's only $40,000. No, it is not based off of that. Yeah. So it, what it's based off of 
Also in our negotiated agreement, you see that we give up to 12 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So they could land on a step 13, you know, if they come in with, you know, all that experience. And then, plus then, we count credits after the credential. Mm -hmm. And so then that's where they're placed on the column. Right. And then if the state, if they've been in the state, then they should be placed on the career ladder. And so we're, they're placed accordingly. I mean, if they're a professional on the professional rung and they're coming in, then we have to pay them, you know, of course, that minimum. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Yeah, I told him to ask because what they were, I think, yeah, I told him to ask you actually because what they were looking at and what I was trying to explain, and they were like, no, no, it really is. Like, yeah, yeah, if they no, if they want to apply, just have them. Yeah. they're confused. Have them get a hold yeah. of me. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other, well, I mean, this is sort of sideline, but the other thing is, is I've talked to probably five people that used to work in the district that would like to come back, but. The understanding in North Idaho is that once you leave Lakeland, you're never hired again. Okay. So we need to fix that. That's yeah. not, we, we actually yeah. are starting that process because we are yeah. recommending a hire to you who used to be at Lakeland High School and went to post Well, that's what I told them. Back. And yes. that depends on the circumstances. I mean, of course, if they were, you know. Right, right, right. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah. They just were under the impression that this was. Yeah, no, we don't. A policy within the last few years. I said, no, we, there was just no. somebody that came through, and yeah, no. That's not. One way we, about. We want yeah. our, no, we want our good people back. Like yeah. We, there's another one who's applying that I'm praying we have a position for because she's amazing. And she yeah. left and then uh, is wanting to come back. Yeah. It, what, is, what is nice to hear is. Both of these teachers left for different reasons, and they regret, and they immediately regretted leaving. So, mm -hmm. so it's nice to know that. Yeah, our salary schedule, respecting that the shadow schedule is in place for those on the professional run or professional track. Wrong. What are doing well? Yeah. And then they're in that little cluster of cells right up there. They're in that little cluster of cells. So, would it be my understanding that eventually our salary schedule is going to be reflective of the shadow schedule so that when we get there, we're there? Well, yeah, we'll yes. probably okay. get about And then I, That's what we're I trying cannot to. wait <laughs> to get rid of that little shadow yeah, I schedule. Bet. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what yeah. is this and why? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when they okay. did that, though, how upset all the teachers were because they just got bypassed for the this, when the state, you know, changed the the uh, salary. You know, all those that were already in the profession just sort of. And just and started. just so you're aware, it affects approximately about 20 teachers right now that I have on that shadow schedule. And then until we get caught up, I'll have some that come off and go on to the regular, yeah. and some that are going to go on it until we get caught up. So it does average at about 20 teachers. It's only year. about seven, eight percent. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. Most people aren't on it. Less yeah. than ten percent. Less than ten, whatever it is. Yeah. I could just imagine it's just more of a headache to constantly track all this. <laughs> it's a blast. Yeah. And part of their packet is I did this form, and it's basically called a career ladder packet. So I can determine like how many out of state um, years of experience in state. And there's all these wacky laws regarding our out of state and. Hopefully we can get those rectified because the those that were hired prior to 2020 didn't count. Their out of state of experience didn't count. For so advanced professional. like I had a yeah. So I have this amazing amazing teacher that had you know almost 20 years of experience More than 20 years. out of state, and we couldn't count count that experience as far as the you know advanced professional endorsement. Right. And then, but then 2020, we're hiring people, and now all of a sudden we're able to count that, and it wasn't fair to those teachers. So right. now they've come up with a remedy, and they're going to be rolling that out. So hopefully, I can, you know, get our people there taken care of. Mm -hmm. Legislation, when they do these big things, I mean, let the, the wording and legislation, they think they're helping, and sometimes it 
it does. Yeah, yeah they don't More always convoluted. know what yeah. the what the implementation side looks like, and mm -hmm. they they lack some clarity. Yeah. 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 Yep. Exactly. So I know that traditionally we have, or I should say, not traditionally, historically we have had um, teachers with longevity in our district. Do you know where we're sitting right now with the ratio of that? Like, so know? just to give you an idea, I was showing Lisa this uh, today because, like I told you, I was kind of working on um, contracts, mm -hmm. and today. I found I have 199 renewable contracts okay. that I'm doing, and the average for all of those is 61,460 is the average salary. Okay. And then um, category three people, I don't have very many. Um, I have actually, well, the average on that is 44,105, and then I have seven people on there. And then my category two, and these are all just returning people. Mm -hmm. This doesn't include any of my new people. Um, I have on category twos so far uh, that are returning um, 55 people. Okay. So they're people that we hired last year and are coming back this year. Okay. That's 55. Okay. Okay. Well, are you familiar with those those terms? Those categories? Just the categories. Well, the category two. So the category one is a brand new teacher. So um, no, category yeah. one. Okay. They Thank are you. are teachers with absolutely no property rights. They come in. They're hired after August first. Okay. So you could have Brooke and I sitting side by side. Brooke gets hired on July thirty first. She's a category two. Year one. Year okay. one. And because I get hired on August 2nd, I'm a category one. So category one, people have zero property rights. By mm -hmm. law, at the end of the year, their job ends. Mm -hmm. That position has to be opened. They are welcome to apply. Right. But we can't just say, we love you and we're going to keep you. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. Category twos um, are people who were hired prior to August 1st. But so, so, you ha so you have a category two first year, and then the next year they're a category two second year. So category twos have no property rights. Right. So at the end of the year, if you're a category two and it's not a good fit, all by law, all we have to do is provide you a reason, a written reason as okay. to why we're not gonna rehire you and there's no due process at all. Okay. Then the third year of employment is a category three. And the category three, there's some property rights, um, not the, to the same level as somebody who's a renewable contract, but they, they definitely, um, we are obligated to provide a, a, a period of improvement, and we have to give them written notice that they're insufficient in some areas mm -hmm. or deficient skills. And we have to write a, an improvement plan. And so there are things we have to do to, to allow them to show that they can grow. So, and then you move in your fourth year with the district, you, you go to a renewable contract. And on a cap three, um, there are some of those uh, property rights, uh, but at the end of the year, they can, you don't need to do a due process hearing with them. Anybody that, you're terminating like in renewables you always if they request a due process hearing it doesn't matter if it's summertime or whatever you always have to do that due process hearing mm -hmm. um and then in the school year if you are trying to uh, terminate a teacher they no matter what category they're allowed a due process hearing okay. if they choose if, if you're doing it during the school yes. year, yeah. There has to be some pretty mm -hmm. extreme circumstances for us to say we're going to terminate in the middle of the school year. Okay. So we really, really keep an eye on our folks. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them all the time, but for sure, you know, in those earlier years. Okay. And the categories have nothing to do with years of teaching experience because if you're brand new to Idaho coming from California and we hire you on June 30th, you're a category two teacher. Yeah, and we hired somebody out of Coeur d'Alene last year who had like, I think, you know, 16 years of experience and it was after August 1, so they were a category one. Mm -hmm. So, it's 
Interesting. The Category 1 legislation was really put in place to kind of try to help school districts, recognizing that when you're hiring that late in the year, you may not be getting prime candidates. Prime candidates. Although I will tell you, I was hired after August 1st. I'm still here. <laughs> and still, there are some good people out there too, but um, it does give the uh, districts the opportunity to just open the position, and and if that person, if, the, if they like the person, then they can rehire them. Is your reading? What? So whether a not whether or not a person is a category one hired after August or hired in June, placing them in a category two position. As far as uh, liability with on the district, there is relatively the same. Okay. Category two person, we just have to put in writing that we're not hiring you back for this reason. Okay. Yeah, and they just give them a little bit more. And like, even our uh, cat ones, um, our cat ones from last year. Did you fall down? Sorry. Our cat ones from last year don't go cat one year one they right. actually jump to cat two year two okay and then right. the next year they'll go they'll hit the third uh, okay so they don't have to start a cat no. two no you're right well cat i just one. Yeah. i know that there's since i've been on the board there's been this push that we don't do any hiring until august to promote the whole you're just a cat one which i don't think it's effective for our district whatsoever because no. we're constantly scrambling. Well, and you don't, so. to, to me, it's the quality hiring. Correct. We want yeah, quality well, teachers. That's the real issue. And so we're right. doing, we're doing the best we can. I mean, it's hard to recruit right now. And so we're doing, we have a lot of people going out. So we're definitely competitive in our hiring and getting that going right now. And okay. I mean, I have, I have, I, I have new <laughs> kids that just came out of college that that were hiring and I have a stack of files where I'm going to be on them to make sure they have their certificate yeah. because they're so new. Right. And so that's just where we are right now. The other thing that with regard to where we are right now, we are we asked our principals to add a question to the interview process that says do you have housing? because we have hired people, they've uh, accepted the job, and then they get here and realize they can't find any place to live and they're rescinding their, they're backing out of their contracts. So we're asking the question ahead of time, do you, have you already secured housing? Well, not backing out of contracts, but backing out of positions. Right, so right. they, they haven't signed the contract. Yeah. Not accepting the yes. position. Mm -hmm. yeah. Accepting and then saying, I can't come. Right. So that's happened to us several times with really quality people, okay. um, but, Housing what is can a we huge do? issue. I, 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 I mean, we're not supporting housing. We, what, yeah, it would be nice if we could, but yeah. like for those first year. Where would we? I mean, it would be lovely to have Lakeland condominiums, you know, for Lakeland did school you, district. Uh, did you read, read that thing I sent you the other day? Uh, they're, they're talking about some federal assistance. Yes. For housing for first responders and teachers. Hmm. But there's but no it's place. It's down the road a ways. Right, it's but the problem is, is there's nothing open. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. Even with all the apartments. Yeah, yeah. it's just it's crazy. It's there's a waiting list. So now there's RV parks coming in. Actually, I just found out that that's not happening. Oh, okay. The person, the person wasn't able to buy the property, so that Are RV park. Down? Well, that one yeah. is. That one in particular. That's interesting. They tried to buy the property, and I don't know if they just couldn't get the funding to buy it, um, but the, it fell through because they, they didn't have the means to buy the The property. city has an opportunity to redeem themselves. Yep. Are you making fun of me? It does. It, it would have been nice to have had this upcoming 22-23 classified salary, classified admin salary matrix. We have the 21-22. So that, there I don't have a 22-23. Those are all, those are all 21-22. That's, that's what, that's just what they're, um, because. Well, was there a cost of living increase? To the only the if the board approves the negotiated agreement. So we can't do anything until the approval is done. But it'll, the, our practice has been that um, okay. 
that whatever increase goes on the teacher salary schedule um, goes across all of the salary schedules. Okay. So it would be a 4% increase. We have, we have precedent for that, but it's not dictated otherwise. Right, it's okay. just past practice. So all of the, the, the salary schedules, the classified, the uh, classified admin, and the admin um, salary schedules will have to go on for board approval at the June meeting. And so I think that's why Lisa wanted some discussion. Right. Yeah, okay. just to have opportunity for you to have eyes on um, at least what it looks like right now, recognizing that it will show increases um, dependent obviously on board action on Thursday, which I guess is tomorrow. Yeah, so really, we don't, I guess what I, which I don't know if it's possible, anything is possible, but if we are basing uh, certified administration, classified administration, classified, and um, if we're, we're basing everything else growth-wise off of the negotiated agreement, I'd like to see what that is. Um, because looking at these numbers, unless I take and calculate the 4%, I'm not going to know. Right. So you're, um, you're indicating that in June you will present a new salary schedule. Correct. And I, I'm and, we and can generate that right, as soon relatively as, quickly. As, if the, okay. Once the board approves the IBB, the negotiated agreement, we can yeah. we can generate that and send them to you so you have them ahead of time to, to look at mm -hmm. So you can just see the dollar amounts. Okay. It's all about the formulas, right? Yeah. yeah. And just what you guys Spreadsheet and copy and paste is a beautiful thing. Cool. <laughs> Drop and drag. Right. There you go. <laughs> I love spreadsheets. I was in them all day today. I was in heaven. Can we... Um, there are a couple of things I just wanted to get some info, input from the board on prior mm -hmm. to us bringing... So my intention in bringing these was not so much about what the money doll would be knowing that that was going to change but um, I, I have I just have some thoughts about a little bit of tweaking okay. so one of the things that um, has that I that came up in my interview from the board was the conversation about stipends and the large dollar amount that we spend in stipends some of those stipends are extra days because we don't have people in the right places on these salary schedules and so instead of fixing the salary schedule we're just adding the stipend up. So what I would like to do is um, talk a little bit about some of the changes that might help with some of those stipends. Um, so if we start with the, um, the certified administrator salary matrix. Okay. Um, Certified administrator? Yes, please. Uh, when you look at the assistant superintendent federal programs director, um, okay. we are significantly behind the, the um, our neighboring districts with what we're paying our um, assistant principal or assistant superintendent. Um, and being the second in charge of the district um, with regard to all of the responsibilities that come with that, I just feel really strongly that the assistant superintendent should be the second highest paid person in the district. So um, that's the only column where I would like to just do a little bit of tweaking to, to bring some of those numbers into alignment. So for example, um, I'm currently on step eight of that, um, so you can see that dollar amount, and um, uh, an assistant superintendent in Post Falls who's in year probably four or five over there is at um, 120. They so actually both are. Yeah, so so um, we're just a little bit out of whack. So with some, um, with permission, I would just like to kind of add a little bit to that particular column to get that person, um, whoever that's going to be, kind of more in line with where that should be. Um, the other 
thought I have is um, if you look at our activities directors, they're on a 220 day contract. And when you look at how much our middle level principal is making, um, and you look at, and, I, and you, so the activities director, it's showing a 220 day contract. So five days more and they're making $7,000 less and they work pretty much every weekend four to five nights a week the, and the level and they're supervising as many staff as our assistant principals are now they're not dealing with student discipline but they are definitely dealing with parents um, so I would like us to have them be this at the same daily rate of pay as the middle school principal um, and then uh, their um, pay would adjust because they would have a, a larger number of days on their contract. And I'm open to feedback on that. Well, my, my question would be, given that you've, the assistant superintendent you've compared with districts, neighboring districts, um, which... Yeah, you don't even want to know how far out of whack we are for athletic activities directors there okay. our neighboring districts are making a hundred and five thousand dollars in that first cell and their budget is and their levies are right exactly so I so I don't I that's why I didn't even go there and I'm yeah. not trying to get them close to that number I'm just trying to look at job responsibilities and duties and time that they're putting in and it just seems um, a little bit out of alignment to me with the the level of responsibility and the amount of time and um, compared to our middle school principal. Well, with between the activities director and the middle level principal, yes, I, I can see that um, within our own pay schedule. Right. I guess what I struggle with is, I mean, and be willing to educate me mm -hmm. and help me with my perspective, but. Our school population doesn't equate to what Coeur d'Alene's is, or even what Post Falls is. But yet, we want to pay our people the same for larger school districts, only because we seem that we don't have some sort of competitive edge because of the dollar amount. Is that the correct, th I mean, yeah. we're only doing it based off of the fact that they're paying more, so we should be paying more, even though we don't have the population size, or the budget, or right. no, and any other so funding like that. Yeah, so um, we're we're definitely closer in population size to Post Falls. I um, I only bring it up because I just want you to have kind of a mm -hmm. frame of reference. Um, the activities director position that I'm referring to is actually at Lake Ponderay, and they are they have fewer kids than we do. Okay. Um, but again, every school district has its own financial issues right. and and right. and needs, right? So I get that, but um, we do have people in the district who are making more than the assistant superintendent in our district. So well, and I don't know how that can be, and that shouldn't be. So that's what so, I'm trying to remedy. I don't want to take away from people who right. are, who are where they are. But when you're the second person in charge, in charge, I get that. That's what I'm trying to remedy. So, um, to go. my computer died. It's time to go. Oh. <laughs> so, I'm I'm happy to put together maybe a couple of different ways to look at it. I'm not married to this. I'm just um, there. These are just a few things that have kind of come to my attention that I just wanted to process with the board. No, and I don't think of it as, 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 a, as a negative. Yeah, no, I don't. Okay. I'm glad you're asking the questions. I just, I, I mean, I get, raising that high school activities director, I, I understand um, in respect to, you know, a middle level principal, I guess. Um, I just, I do think we always want to be fair and equitable. And I do think that, you know, there should be a consideration for cost of living increase. 
Um, because which, yeah, which will be right, able to which will drive the school, which so. will show up on this too because yeah. the four percent will go in and that will be part of the calculation. Like I'm not going to make ch big sweeping changes and then add four percent on top of that. It'll right. be based on what that looks like. But I would like to <coughs> get the su uh, the assistant superintendent column to the point where. And I, yeah, if we are in a position where uh, people have the ability to be in different positions and earn more than the second in command, that's that's a little out of balance for our district, I think, yeah. wholeheartedly. Um, and it shouldn't be that way at all. So yeah, you, I guess we need to have an understanding of how we are out of balance, how that <coughs> happens, how it's out of balance so that we can figure out how to bring it in line and make sure that we're keeping those that are in the positions of authority being paid what the position actually uh, merits. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any qualms with uh, figuring that component out. Okay. Uh, I think at the very least the activities directors, even if we put them at the same annual pay divided over the 200, so it would be slightly less on the daily. As the assistant, or as a middle school principal. As a middle school, but as a middle school principal, but then just dividing it over the number of days, like it, um, just for an example. Yeah, right. The daily yeah. rate of pay is less, yep. Yeah. Yep. It's slightly less, but they're paid at least the same annually. I can definitely do that. Um, However, but it's it's not a huge difference to. Uh, Although what I think I heard Lisa saying was she wanted them to receive the same daily rate of pay. Right. I know we, that. Okay. I was just throwing out just yeah. a oh a, okay. a different okay. way. Maybe we it. could yeah. even look at it this way, and where we, they make the same and annually. We, they're just making a little bit less as their daily rate okay but they're still making more than what they're making now yeah and i don't right. want to diminish so the work of the middle school principal either because right. they well and like yeah. you said they, they should be this, earning but then they do this but right then they, they just should be earning some maybe. combat pay over there yeah. because <laughs> middle school kids oh, are challenging no <laughs> um, no I, I love them all i but survived my one <laughs> yeah so but i actually like that idea trustee bain um I just want to honor the amount of time that we're asking our activities directors to be away from their families and sure. the level of supervision that and responsibility they have there. So, well, it appears that um, when this was created <coughs> by whomever, um, as far as the categories, it seems like we have prioritized the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so the hierarchy would then move activities directors, activity directors. Yeah. Um, above an elementary principal or an SWD director. Right. So I don't know, I, I don't know if that's appropriate or inappropriate. I, d I don't know what the perspective and would I, be uh, in respect to hierarchy because it seems like that's what we've um, created here based on it's really more about the daily rate of pay and the the level of um, the time commitment and the level of responsibility. Okay. And I just feel like the activities director is a little bit out of whack with regard to um, following the elementary principal, where they just have you know three or four evening events. And there another one that actually gets extra days stipend. And so if you take those extra days stipend. Yeah, which that has to be under control. Yeah. yeah. Who has but additional days stipends? Uh, the activities directors yeah. do. Be, be so they're contracting for two twenty and then paid for more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to try to get their rate of pay up because the because of the way this salary. Well, and because working. they're actually they do their work over the summertime. Mm -hmm. Is was the extra days that wasn't factored in? Is there statutory language regarding the um, stipends? Or is that just kind of oh, up to feel. the district? Yep. Uh -huh. When this comes back to yeah, us, there is, as far as, uh, sorry, I was just going to answer you, Zeta, mm -hmm. there is statute regarding stipends, but it doesn't necessarily lay out the rate of pay. But it does delineate what they are. I would appreciate mm -hmm. the, the layout yeah. to be 
uh, move the activities director in front of the middle level because then you actually have the contract days lining out priority or hierarchy. Yep. Guess so what it will be so the the so order is based on the contract number of contracts. Correct. Okay. Because we're going from two thirty down to two ten. And we kind of put the activities director, which is a two twenty in between two hundred and thirteen, which actually maybe I think maybe that's why it's highlighted because we made a change last year because they did have extra days. And I think we did embed some of those extra days in, in that. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll take a look at that. Okay. <clears throat> and then, sorry, do you have more? No, I was just gonna say, regardless, even if they are paid less, I think it would be more appropriate to have the hierarchy be the number of days on the contract. Yep, I like that. Okay. Lisa, uh, Help me understand where the discrepancy is with the assistant superintendents. It's not on this particular, it's with a classified staff person, a classified administrator. Oh. And I'm not, I'm not begrudging that person what that person makes. I just feel pretty strongly that the second in command needs to be the second highest paid person. So. So does this column reflect what the current situation is, the Assistant Superintendent Federal Programs Director? Mm -hmm. and, and you said that there were other people in the district who were getting paid more based on stipends, is that what happens? No, just, well, I don't, I, I, that I don't. Step. I'm not yeah. seeing it here, that's why. Yeah. You guys do have those in your packet. packet. It's, yeah. it's on the classified administrator's schedule. Is that the one that had? No, not the certified. No, the one that had the federal program oh, director. Right. That was the. So the assistant superintendent is certified. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Well, it's, it's me. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's, I'm trying not to say anything out loud. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I don't begrudge him any of what he, what he makes, but this. Uh, I don't know. I, right. no. But he's also a certified administrator. I understand your concern. But he's also okay. Step ten. The PDF down. That one. This one. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. Well. I and I I am not anticipating moving changing this just to your point to like I wouldn't have the first step in this be the higher than the last step in his call. And that's not my. Uh, okay. That's not what okay. I'm, I'm planning on. I just want to get it a little bit closer. Gotcha. Okay. So are we in the process of resolving the stipend problem? Yes, in doing I'm all trying. This? Yes, I'm trying to so alleviate. The stipends some of for these folks are, are going to go away. Yeah. I yeah. would love that. Yes, in I fact. Know. <laughs> so a lot less trash. So I have yeah. another question. <laughs> yes. I have lots of questions. In in, in thinking about that, um, well, first of all, I guess. Um, Currently, the assistant superintendent position is posted. Um, I posted it last Friday. It'll close this Friday, um, and then we'll do interviews. Um, based just on some of the conversation that we had when we met um, in my interview, um, there was some conversation about feeling like administratively we're maybe a little bit heavy. And at this time of the year, opening another admin admin position at the district office I just it makes me a little bit nervous that we might bring somebody on who's not gonna help us be super strong as a team um, and so I, I have talked to um, so Dr. Pasley has applied um, at this point that she's the only applicant somebody else may apply um, if nobody else does and she is the person who ends up in that position my my thought moving forward would be that we not fill that fourth administrative position this year at the district level um just to give us some time to kind of figure out what each of us is going to take on we we know we work really well together uh our uh our strengths and weaknesses are it's a really nice balance and we feel like um, based on what we've been doing that we can we can add, do the job well and not have things falling through the cracks obviously we'll be 
taking copious notes so that if that is the case, we'll be communicating that with the board. But that is our kind of intention right now. So one of the other pieces of, like with regard to stipends, Kelsey Badger, who is our SWD director, um, is on a 213-day contract in the same column as the elementary principal, but she works 230 days. So she's getting a stipend for that. So who is, who is that? Our SWD. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think we should, yeah, have some executive. Oh, well then, if this isn't appropriate, oh. we can, I just. Well, I think with the whole, the names and people, yeah, I mean, true. a lot of it is, is public information anyways, but I think we're sort of skating the line. Okay. Um, but we can still talk about the position. position. So I, yeah. I would. <clears throat> Actually, I'm wondering what the board feels um, about, and this was this kind of has been the plan for us for a couple of years was that eventually the SWD director would be the federal programs director. Um, we just wanted to give her some you know, time to get her feet under her, um, which would then move her over into the federal programs column, and we would and we would take, then the stipend would go away because she's already working that number of days. She's already doing a lot of that job. And so we're just looking at most of the stipends that we know we can get rid of are the extra day stipends. So we're looking at how do we make sure that people are placed appropriately so that we can do away with the extra days. So that's kind of some of the work behind the scenes on the salary schedules. And that's the way it was prior to Kelsey assuming the position in the base, right? It was still the same as the, or, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Call around her own concerns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I guess to kind of clarify, when we established, or when we hired for the SWD director position, we hired that person with the expectation of working 213 days or yep. did we okay so we did do that well but the position okay so yeah. or is it that we knew that the SWD director should actually be on a 220 or 230 day contract but we didn't hire it that way. Um, that yes. Okay. Can't be um, I would say that she was hired and maybe there wasn't a really good estimation of the amount of work okay. that it actually took to okay. do the job. Um, one of the things that is happening is that um, throughout the summer parents are calling and requesting a meeting with the SWD director because they're moving to our district and they've got a child on an IEP and they want to talk about services and um, or the IEPs are being sent in and she's got to go through them to make sure that we have the resources that we need to have ready to go when okay. school starts so I, I just don't know that there was a, a really good estimation of how much work it really takes okay. so she the thought was it's probably about what an elementary principal does so that's where she was placed on the salary schedule and I think now that she's done it for um, a while is this her second year yeah um, yes. uh, she we know we definitely know what it takes for her to get the job done and it does require those additional days well with respect to that if SWD if the director needs 230 days to do that, how is she going to do the federal programs job if that position requires 230 days, which respectively, uh, I know it's kind of been... Uh, oh, actually it was split. I, I misspoke. That the federal programs was split with a principal. Correct. Mm -hmm. time. Correct. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. It because wasn't the SWD director. I, I, yeah. We all know my beef with having people wear multiple titles and these pointing threes and point sevens and point twos of <laughs> positions. But 
I don't want to give a position as significant as the federal programs director. Um, it, you know, I don't want to chop it at the knees. Mm -hmm. And I know SWD is a significant position. What I hear you saying is possibly, you know, merging those two within one person. But what I don't know is if we have a clear understanding of the federal programs director. I mean, is that position a 230 day contracted position? Because, I mean, it was brought to us that it's not that big of a deal, it's just part time, it's, you know, it's, it's, for lack of a better word and not trying to use inappropriate words, it was kind of insignificant, the amount of time that needed to be committed to that position, which it's a federal programs director. I think time needs to be committed to that to make sure we're in alignment and we're properly following procedures and statutes and federal regulations so that we don't get in hot water. Right. So what I, what I would say to that is, um, when Bob was the superintendent, mm -hmm. we had a federal programs director. She she was in charge of special education and Title One. Okay. Um, so it definitely can be done. What I would tell you that I think we need. So right now, our current SWD t uh, director has a consulting teacher who works with her. Okay. For SWD, if we had instead of hiring another full-time administrator at the district office, if we had a consulting title teacher okay. working under the federal programs director, the federal programs director then could take care of all the compliance pieces of, okay. of the, because title is a federal program, right. so, um, and work with Brian on the budgeting aspects of it, but then you have two instructional experts who are working with the instructional staff on compliance issues and things in the schools. Okay. So if we, instead of doing a full-time person for the federal programs, mm -hmm. um, if we if we structured it in that way, and you've done this before, so feel free to speak up. <laughs> Whether you agree with me or not, I just, I do want to hear no, what you have right. to no, say. Right. Um, I, I do think you can't that, that it, it could be, um, it would work um, fine. Okay. So what I hear you saying is that in eliminating one more thing to say. That's okay. In, <laughs> in merging the federal program director and SWD director, in a sense, we would be uh, decreasing one certified administrator. However, on the flip side, we would need to employ one, maybe two, um, more bodies, teachers positions underneath that the SWD director is going to oversee mm -hmm. to make that those programs and that department run as smoothly as it can. Yes. The thing I wanted to add to that, going back to the stipends, is we currently pay a $3,000 stipend to somebody to um, kind of oversee the ELL program, the English Language Learner Program, which is a title program. Mm -hmm. And we um, and we pay another stipend to somebody to oversee the homeless um, part of Title I. I. We would do away with those stipends and all of those those two pieces would go with that Title I uh, consulting teacher and, and, the, and the federal programs director. So okay. it, this is my way, of, I've really been thinking since we met about what you said about stipends and then um, there was the comment about just some administrative pieces mm -hmm. and so I've just been trying to think how do I take care of some of that um, without putting us in a position where we can't do our jobs. Correct. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be coming to you with this idea if mm -hmm. I didn't think it was going to work for kids in the schools okay. and that we couldn't do it. So I mean I would love to see our SWD federal programs department actually not be struggling mm -hmm. in trying to maintain mm -hmm. its effectiveness for our district. That's just, that's not healthy for anyone. Right. And they and the title and the SWD work hand in hand on a lot of things because okay. SWDs are tier three and titles are tier two and so they're working on interventions together and oftentimes 
SWD teachers are providing interventions to our title kids because that's where their instructional level is for that intervention time and or vice versa. So they already work really um, well together and collaboratively. So. Um, and that, and that was a lot of the reason why we did it at the time when I was involved, uh, you know, put those two together because there's a, quite a bit of overlap there, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of teaching staff and as well as responsibility for the director. And then both Dr. Pasley and I have led the Title I um, part of federal programs, and so we are obviously there to assist as needed. Um, but one of the things we've been working on is kind of a task analysis, like this is what Lisa's going to be responsible for, this is what Lynn is responsible for, this is what, you know, Kelsey's responsible for, so um, everything so far fits neatly <laughs> into that so little far. puzzle. So, the, so you, you know, realize there's a list, laundry list of... Well, I've been checking in with, with uh, Board Chair Thompson, just saying, okay, so I, I know this is something that the superintendent does, and, and um, what do you want that to look like? So I'm trying to kind of figure some of those pieces out, the parts of the superintendency that I didn't do really are mm -hmm. anything related to the board. Mm -hmm. So just um, kind of working through that. So with your permission, I, I, I will just kind of play with this and maybe give you a couple of different options to look at, um, and I'll, I will give them to you well in advance of the June 15th board meeting so that you have lots of opportunities to look at them and, and then Ask, ask me some questions. I mean, uh, you're, you're better at this than I, obviously, but uh, I think what would be helpful to the board if, if in some sort of chart form, you know, we can see what the existing alignment is and what your recommended alignment would be in the future. Okay. As far as, sorry, as far as? Positions. At, at this level, at the district office. Okay. And do you want like um, do you want to see the task analysis we're putting together so you can kind of no. you don't want that no. level <laughs> you don't want that level of detail uh, sure okay um, it's actually I guess when does the org chart get um, approved it's already been approved but we'll need to reapprove it right we do it every year right when yeah, do we, we usually do it in February. February oh after oh. the after yeah the after we appoint <coughs> okay yeah. goals. so. Uh, would, if I worked summer. with, um, in the summer. They, they change if it's a significant yeah. change, yeah. Sure. we should still we agree. Agree. Yeah. 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 Well, we I'm just wondering if that's so the easiest so way, bad. as far as a chart yeah. goes, for you to There's see changes if is on done, that work chart. If I work with, who did the last one? Yeah. Rebecca. So if I work with Rebecca and, and have her make these changes, I'm suggesting on a copy of the org chart, you could look at them side by side. Is that good enough or would you prefer looking at it in a different way? No, that's fine. Okay. Whatever is easy for you or Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> right, and all of this obviously is going to have to be after we see who ends up as the assistant superintendent. Yeah. So. Okay. So did we come to a consensus on the app? Activities director thing, exactly how we're going to approach that. Not, we had two or three ideas on the table, I'm not sure. I don't know that we came to a consensus on Yeah, I, I, act we did either. I, I actually think. liked um, Trustee Bain's idea about um, having them have a little bit lower daily rate of pay than the middle school principal, but. Um, the annualized the, salary would be the same. With, yeah. Because the number the of other, contract The other issue I heard was a kind of a hierarchy thing. Mm -hmm. That I got. Mm -hmm. That was, we're going to put it in there according to number of days contracted instead of what the position is. Okay. okay. Thank you for bearing with me, this is a lot. Mm -hmm. um. One other thing, when this is all said and done, I know Brooke's trying to get rid of stipends, so if we have any <coughs> left over, we'd like to know what those are. Yes, so there will be some stipends we're not gonna be able to get away from all of our athletic coaches right. and our activities 
um, advisors. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah those are all going to be. Yeah, that's. But those, those are ones that make sense. Those yeah. make sense to me to, to keep those. I mean, that's undisclosed in addition to right. the Somebody additional work. We should like probably put like. Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, uh, you know, across the board with certificate staff. I mean, there's. Yeah, we have a lot. With leadership stipends, some stipends that are in negotiated agreement. Things that have been there a long yeah, but time. Those are identified as such. So. Correct. Um, most, you know, the master stipend. I mean, we'll still have quite a few stipends just right. to know, but we certainly can even look like, at the ones that I mean, make sense. I think what you're doing or something like that. and pair them. And yeah, so we yeah have, I, which I think is yeah, we have some easier for us actually for payroll and everything. We're yeah. I, I have no problem. <laughs> I'm just telling you, there's. It, it is sort of, some of them are just, yes, they are, I guess. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, a, it's a little bit easier to handle some of, um, some of like, at the admin level, because it's, it, it really gets down to the number of days you're working, and that, that's how that's filling the gap. But you have to, with the certified staff, you know, we have, um, we have people who are kind of um, lead people for groups and so there's a lot of there's work outside of their contracted day and so they're, they're getting paid for that or they we have this year I've got um, high school science teachers who are working on um, their instructional calendars uh, looking at some scaffold just adding resources and scaffolding for some kids who are struggling with reading and math and are making it makes science harder and that's they're doing that during their summer vacation so I'm paying them a stipend for work outside of contract time so we can definitely group them yeah just categorize it mm -hmm. yeah. so that um, and then I don't know if it's helpful before you have to uh, before you have to approve all the stipends if we have a, I, I know you love meetings but if we had like a quick meeting like this I was talking to um, Michelle earlier it just seems like sometimes we ask you to make to approve things where you don't always have a lot of knowledge about them and and it's hard to get those questions answered and then feel like you can make an informed decision about how to vote um, so if we could identify what some of those are and have these kinds of meetings where we get to work through things together and you tell us kind of what you need to, to feel like you have everything dialed in so that you could make a, a, a motion and um, approve um, whatever's coming your way. I'm happy to facilitate that or, or um, I just want to kind of know what the board's pleasure is with regard to that. Um, uh, our classified salary schedule. So Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about what our plan is for classified? Well, because we're having a, a few issues with uh, our, so, some of our veteran Yeah, so staff. when I, the classified salary schedule has, which is actually getting fairly similar to, if you look at our, some of our peer districts and things like that. Um, several years ago, we didn't have a classified salary schedule. Um, and so, you know, the board adopted it and as we've sort of had the first schedule that was adopted and throughout a couple years it, it's gone through a, a couple of revisions. Um, one, the first version of it had many more like differences between paraprofessionals and we sort of just collapse them into mostly you're a paraprofessional and you might one paraprofessional might be a title one paraprofessional another one might be a regular ed but you know sometimes it, they go back and forth between the work so we collapsed some of those positions and then we also had a, a point where maybe some of the classifications really weren't classified correctly and they said well this work maybe should be moved over a column so we've had some of these changes and as we've made those changes, let's say you were in the group that, like custodians originally were on the far left of the column. And you know, it's part of trying to recruit, plus it's, it can be um, you know, hard work. We moved them a, a little more to the middle of the salary schedule. And when we moved them, let's say they were a step 10, I'm just using an example. 
And since they were sort of on this new column, we moved them. We didn't keep them on step 10, and they moved direct to the new step 10. Because maybe by moving from that step 10 over here, and we got rid of that, and they moved to this other column to step three, that next year they got like a six or seven percent raise. So, you know, not a 18 percent raise. So now they're a step three and then they start moving down. So as we've done a couple of those shifts, what's happened is we have some people that are sort of veteran staff, but they're, depending on their column, they're, say, a few years of experience because it, we weren't saying you had the 10 years, it was trying to place, uh, and really in a dollar way. And give them room to grow. And give them room to grow. Mm -hmm. we, we think, you know, and I can, Brooke can chime in also, that the salary schedule after looking at these, and she's done a lot of work at classifications, that it's getting more solid. And now, like this year, what happened is we would get um, a new hire. And, you know, let's say they come in with five, six years of experience um, of, let's say from another district to make it easy. And, and so Brooke would place them at, let's say step five or six. And so now you have the new person who comes on staff sort of placed higher than let's say someone who's on step three because they, they were a tenure employee but they had this, that history. And so we're thinking that to rectify some of those things and honor our veteran staff that we might have to give a few veteran staff for you know after 10 plus maybe a couple steps down to try to catch up for an equity stake of you you know no, no decisions are made these are us just thinking um, because it's tough when you if you let's say you're the veteran staff member and you're training the new person but they're making more than you right I mean, and so it's sort of a that shouldn't happen no yeah. and so but you know and it's as we've gone through this process it's um you know no good deed goes unpunished it seems right because we're we were people were making getting more compensation on an annual basis they were making more money as we went through that it just happened that some of the changes we couldn't just say you're suddenly a step 10 over here and give someone a 25 percent of your raise i mean if we also didn't foresee COVID and the impact and the COVID impact had on, on the salary on schedule salaries. and things like that. So, one thing that, like for example, that we looked at also just as a practice, that we on the teacher side, you know, it's been in our negotiated agreement where, you know, step thirteen is sort of where they you come get in. up to twelve years. Up to twelve experience. years. Mm -hmm. So we we think we need to have that same philosophy with the class by step they don't have as many steps as 28 so it's probably around step six or seven would be the max that we can really have someone come in even if they say I've worked in this position for 20 years because I mean it's sort of consistent what we're doing with 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 our other um, group of staff it should just be one scale across the board the military doesn't do that what do you mean one scale across the board? Well, your base pay is based on your service, years of service, period. So you can't have people outperforming you no matter what. So if I come in, if I, listen, so here's an example. I was in the guard in Reno, okay? And then I transferred to the guard in Oregon. Just because I had 20 some years of experience doesn't mean I'm gonna get a pay raise, it's based, based on my rank, you know? So you don't get extra money just because you have more experience or you, you're, everybody's the same that's like across the board so you don't you don't have that you can't outwork somebody that's been there no right. matter what right. it's based on what you started as yeah the problem that we're having is that recruiting and retaining staff mm -hmm. so if we told if we told classified staff you get zero years of experience and you go in the first cell and you have to work your way through in our system we wouldn't be able to we, we, we would struggle to hire people so well, that's so what I'm saying though everybody's the same across the board I don't understand this is a this is a federally based pay system right I mean <laughs> no it's state it's by state this is so. district so it's, it's just district. It's well, so yeah, for classified. So it's typical in schools. 
that for the non-teaching staff, classified we call them, that there's different classifications. So in other words, if you're a journeyman electrician working right. on the maintenance crew, right. you're gonna get paid higher than the nighttime cleaning custodian. That's just standard practice. Right. So because you're a journeyman electrician, you have all that training, you're working with all that. So our lead mechanic is, does get compensated higher than our bus drivers in that same department. Right. Um, and so that's what I'm talking about these classifications is that we've had some movement of those call them the history but that so if I have um, so let's say as we've worked through the years with no salary schedule now to where we're at and let's say I had a my HVAC Ken Hart oh, I'm sorry shouldn't say let's use but we have a an experienced custodian who used to be on this call on the left and when they transferred they were step 10 they went to three and then we just had a new hire and they've had 10 years of experience at Coeur d'Alene as a custodian and we gave them seven so now I have this one custodian who just came in who's getting more see the dilemma we've right. sort of been so we're just trying to honor I think some of our veteran staff and move them down a little bit. We can't do it forever and it's never going to be perfect, but we're trying to... We're trying to find that sweet spot in between so least, of, of honoring our current staff, but still being able to recruit yeah, really and because we're having, we're really, really struggling with that. And also able to um, afford it. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. you know, there's, yeah. there is um, that. there's sort of all that because a little caveat, <laughs> right? Um, Final analysis. That's the main point. Well, that's right. yeah. yeah. So, but we do want um, to. So for, I mean, there's just we're, I think we're looking at that. I mean, as far as the, if one person or if a group was able to move down more than one. I mean, everybody right now, they move down one. If they stay with us, they go down one. So let's say, for example, more veteran staff we allowed to go down two or three. That would be consistent, though. It'd have to be you've been with the district for X That would be years. on a tiered thing. Yeah. So can you, can you give us a feel for you know how many personnel maybe we're talking about that needs that kind of adjustment and how much of an adjustment mm. are we talking about? I haven't. I haven't. I mean, it would be... I mean, it'd be several. I mean, it maybe fifty percent. Fifty percent of our staff, possibly. So, oh. like, yeah. So, if you have, I mean, but Brian came up with a plan of like, if you've been here what three to five years, then you'd move down an extra step, like two extra steps. If you've been here like you know six maybe to ten six, years, you get maybe maybe. You get, Three or three. right, and then maybe if you're 15 plus, you, you and then would. plus the four percent cola on the schedule. So and what? then the plan would be to also get rid of that column F, and this is where we would probably do a stipend because we only have one category in there. Well, I was going to ask who placed the titles in those categories. I mean, how is that determined? Um, so, prior to Dr. Meyer coming to Lakeland, um, just prior, Lake Ponderé paid a lot of money um, to have a, a, a consulting firm come in and look at um, levels of supervision and job responsibilities and classify different jobs within the district. And um, so we we were able to kind of piggyback on that and use some of that information. And so it wasn't something that we did, it was something that, a, uh, yeah. There wasn't a salary schedule at all prior to this. It was a lot of times just picking and choosing. Well, and I'm not yeah. against the salary schedule. I'm a little confused why if you have a lead mechanic and a lead custodial and the lead grounds and a lead maintenance, why they are not all in the same category. I don't understand that. Well, they are. I mean, yeah, and so because I don't, but then we also have a head custodian, and I'd like to know what the difference between a head custodian and a lead custodian are, because to me it seems like 
they should or could be one and the same. No. So we have a, a lead custodian that is a district position okay. at the facilities department. Yep. Okay. And they basically are responsible uh, for the training and okay. overseeing. Okay. So it's a different one. Um, the head custodian is the daytime custodian in our buildings who's there during the day when the kids are in the building too. The, the, and then the, the custodian is the night person? The cleaning crew. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The head custodian typically does uh, more than, doesn't do very much cleaning and it's more actual maintenance of the facility. Um, minor, minor maintenance. Mm -hmm. So there is a tool. Okay. That can be done. So, like, if somebody wants says, "Oh, I have more job responsibility. I my job description consists of more of these duties or whatever," then they can come to across for and request like a reclassification of the position. And then there's certain criteria that it's a point system. And then if they fall into this certain amount of points, like what do they have supervisory skills? Do they have financial responsibility? Um, do they, it, it's different responsibilities. And if they fall into that column, then that's where they're placed. Yeah. So it's a ranking system. Yeah. It's, it wasn't willy nilly. We just put people where we thought they should go. There was actual like a formula. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I get that. I'm just trying to understand why one lead would be a step above four others or three others. I can't quite read, but it. it's because of where that mechanic and the lead mechanic where they fell as far as hourly rate in the, before this all happened. And so the mechanic is more in line with everything in that column. The the two mechanics are weird because they've been here forever and so it has to do with history and where they fell and stuff like Some that. Some of it, I, I think, at least in the past, uh, has to do with skill level and uh, Educational background. the kind of skills they have mm -hmm. that they bring to the position mm -hmm. which may be greater than the guy that's working alongside of them. Right, which I, I firmly believe a person should be paid based on their skills, their education, everything that they have invested into it. But what I hear the dilemma we're having is we have this forced pay scale that we're putting people in, and then when we go to try and we have people that are like being paid for their skill, but because we have to move them, then we're creating our own problem. They, so uh, yeah, it got created a while back. I think, but we're just trying to resolve it. Well, right. can't you just have <clears throat> each job? So I'm just going back to what I know. When I worked for Boeing, you were hired as a plane captain, and that was your starting salary. And then the only raises you got were if they were negotiated by the union or whatever. There was no steps. If you got a lead position, you got a dollar raise. If you got a supervisor position, you got two or three dollar raise. I don't know. I'm just thinking. And that's that's like, some of what's built in here. Yeah, but if you had more quals, then you had you got a dollar. Like say, if I got qualified on another aircraft, I would get it a dollar raise. You know, something like that. I don't know how you would do it though. Because there's so many and all, jobs. And all of that is like kind of built in because like for example, you have a BI specialist that's right. in there versus a para. What is the difference? Well, the BI specialist, both of those positions can A, fall into Medicaid billing, but a BI specialist is a higher billable position because you actually have to have a four-year degree. Hmm. And so they're able to make more money. They're going to start higher. In right, different their skill yeah. level is higher, their background knowledge level. So it's just it's things like that. It is based on. And typically, I mean, the only ones on here that have to do really with a, a degree is a BI specialist and the interpreter. We have an interpreter that we can have that um, isn't certified. 
and so they're down there, but then you have a certified interpreter. But basically, those are the only positions where they're paid at a higher column because of the degree. On our classified staff, it, that's the only ones that... Yeah, the other thing that is hard is that column A, um, and when we think about our base program, is there's like no wonder that we have it's a revolving door when mm -hmm. our starting salaries. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, because they're hiring smiling faces across the street for seventeen. Yeah, an hour. and I mean we yeah, upped that right. column from like it's nine dollars an hour what? last year yeah. to this, and so it is right now. It's so frustrating because I feel like we need to like take off the first two columns and add two at the end. That's kind of how I feel. Right. Right. That's that's a significant dollar amount then that you're. I mean, it's that's where we need to go. But so how do we get there? Last year, you're saying that basically we shouldn't have a starting salary less than sixteen dollars. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Well, I think that we should be adjust. We, I think that we should be adjusting the entire scale. Anytime there's a cola increase, say that cola increase is two percent, the entire scale needs to move two percent so that. See, all Correct. these cells, yeah, we get, okay. they, all okay. these cells okay. will get a 4% yeah. increase, okay. yeah. okay. but I don't, I still don't think we're going to, I mean, we can do this year the 4%, 4 and then what Brian is suggesting to honor our, our veteran staff, but I just don't think we're going to, I just, I mean, we're a public entity and we're only given so much money. Mm -hmm. We can't compete with McDonald's, unfortunately. I mean, where they can increase their, you know, the the prices on a hamburger and yeah. it's hard. Well, yeah, we're starting bus drivers at sixteen oh nine an hour, but we can't recruit enough bus drivers to man our stations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they're only working, you know, driving, you know, a few hours a day, so it's like, I mean, it's yeah. I just, you know, people can't live on it. And you'll no. find in the exit interviews on our classified staff that some of them said, I, I can't afford to work here. Yeah. I mean, it's the cost, of, it's it's reality of what's happening in our area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. But, I mean, in dollar-wise, I mean, last year when we, we added more to the salary schedule than what we did for the certified teachers that was a five hundred thousand dollar increase overall yeah so um, they were they, they were like really low on right. the scale and we're this. and we're actually if you start looking at the other uh salary schedules you know from post falls Coeur d'Alene Lake Ponderay Moscow all that we're not that different honestly some mm -hmm. of the positions there they're, um, you know, I know talking to some of the other neighboring districts that they're facing the same thing and are looking at doing um, uh, some higher increases on the classified side. Um, you know, the thing is, is like if we did say, okay, our minimum was $16 an hour, then, you know, but you have to move everybody across then, right? Right. Um, yeah. And that would be... You know, you're talking a 30% increase. That would be millions. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's just, and we get funded by the state for a classified salary. Um, roughly about half the positions we actually have by the funding formula. That's probably the one that's as far as the way the formula works. And they give us approximately, I think, twenty-three thousand dollars for a full-time FTE. That's someone working 260 days a year, eight days an hour. It, you know, so 2080 hours, so that's a full time FTE, which 23,000 equates to about 11 bucks an hour is what the state provides us yeah, before taxes, mm -hmm. correct? So, well, and that, that goes to the other piece of the puzzle, and that is uh, numbers of staff and whether or not. You know, we don't have enough, or maybe we got a few more than we need, mm -hmm. uh, right. which could help you know fund the increase if we didn't have. I, I, I'm just, I'm not suggesting one way or the other. I'm just saying that's a piece of the puzzle we have to cope with. Right, and yeah. I think to prioritize the uh, prior priority. I'm thinking so tired. <laughs> Anyways, you know what I'm trying to say. Prioritize. Prioritizing uh, what 
you know, what is our priority? You know, is our priority sports or is our priority reading and writing? Is our priority, you know, making sure we have so many paras or SWDs or whatever, or so many assistants, or I, I think we need to, with the way everything's going, I just think that we're pushed to that. We're really going to have to look and see what is our priority, and we're going to have to make some hard decisions. Even if we went back to the list of um, the, the aggressive maintenance schedule, um, which hasn't been updated in a few months, so I'm sure some of this stuff might be working on. Or, um, but just off the top of our heads, going through the district, looking for thing, looking at things that need to be done, um, we have twenty-eight million two hundred ninety-four thousand two hundred twenty-five dollars in maintenance that needs to be done in the district, and that's not at current prices. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And now we need to pay people because we can't run the district without people, you know, but. Or to a point, they might not even be able to drive to work. Right. As we get further right. into the right. year, right. based off of what we're, we're yeah. paying. So, yeah, so I get that we have all these other positions in the district that get all this stipend, stipend, stipend. They were very heavy into sports, but the bottom line is, is that we're an educational institution and we're getting squeezed pretty close to not being able to provide a very good education in my estimation. We, we're, we're trying to implement curriculum. We don't even have curriculum. I, I, I just think we need an overall picture in my brain anyways, an overall picture to really take a hard look at where are we and where are we going you know because we can piecemeal it all together but then when when something comes up because we don't have that view then we're stuck you know trying to take this from here or this from here or mm -hmm. um what would be nice to understand is and i i don't know how much work this would be but how many of these positions do we have? I mean, like, how many days para pros do we have? Which I don't really even think we should go there. Cause we don't have very many. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, how many admin assistants do we have? And I mean, I can get you all that information. Okay. And, and, and where are up. they? I mean, like, how many does Betty Keeper have? How many does Gartwood have? How yeah, many? we have no inventory of what we look like. Oh yeah, like, that's, that's, you know? that okay. would be that difficult. Yeah. I can okay. provide that. I guess, when would you want me to provide that? I mean, we're working on... Next week, no. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Never mind that she's trying to do 199. <laughs> well, I would Contract. say when these schedules are being presented for approval... June. Yeah, it would be appropriate to have that information because did you jiggle something? I just went like this. Oh, okay, I'm like sorry. Somebody's trying to get in. This what is scary. <laughs> Poor Bob. I'm looking at him going, what are you doing over there? Um, it would be nice to know because we do need, I mean, we have the dilemma that we don't pay well for entry level positions when we have to compete with the other industries. I will tell you, and this is just, Lisa knows how I feel about this, I know that there's a couple of positions that are not paid where they, they should be, and like I really feel the paraprofessionals have become a big part uh, with our increasing um, yeah. students with disabilities that we have in our district, and those significant behaviors. Those paraprofessionals are literally getting beat up. Yeah. No, I yeah. Know. Every day, go home with bruises and, I mean, everything else. And so I, I feel like, you know, passionately, that's one group. I mean, all of us, all of them are underpaid. Our base, you know, our base paras and everything else. And that's a difficult job in itself because there's split shifts on that, which makes that position um, more difficult. There's dilemmas in uh, in several of them. I just I don't know what the solution is when, like Brian says, you know we're being only funded 
eleven dollars an hour. Yeah. Right. On them. I, I think in the big picture you have to look is that you know you you, you don't in an organization and that has you know multiple funding sources and it's big like us and and in these public systems, you know, change just doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And so are you moving the right direction? So effectively, if we added 4% to this base, and some people move down one step, that's a 5.8% raise for next year for them, mm -hmm. because going down is 1.8%. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum, they're almost getting 6%. And I know it's not perfect, but that's not insignificant when mm -hmm. you have several hundred staff members. It, then we took some of the veteran staff who sort of, in a sense, were moved and sort of didn't have that lateral shift and got them down, then every time they went another 1.8, uh, is another 1.8, so let's say they went down three, um, you know, they're almost getting a 10% raise. That's, I mean, we can only move so fast. Yeah. Our revenues are our revenues, we can't raise our price. Yeah. So I, I think that it, some like of it is what can you do, and, and we have a lot of needs, right? So. Yeah. We're looking at transferring some funds from the general fund to take some of the capital projects. That's good. We're we looking at increasing the salary schedule and move right in that direction. Um, we have the ability to purchase curriculum um, because of the ESSER funds and move in that direction positively. So we, if you look at this budget, there's a lot of really good positive things moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And you just have to know that, and I definitely understand because we all want what's best for the program and for right. our community and want to get there now but sometimes it you know you just sort of have to take those those good steps forward and do what you can and yeah. then continue that that uh, march you know positive mm -hmm. march you know as we move forward yeah right so I mean I, I just I mean we I just want to I guess put in a and I'm the negative person <laughs> right? ah. that, you know that we're you know that it, it is a lot of times we sit here and you sort of start it can be frustrating you sort of admire the problem but I, if you look at what sort of before you today I think that we are um, trying to move forward and address those at, mm -hmm. a, at a manageable pace yeah I have a question about head not admins, I guess. yeah admins is there a set admin for high school for population wise no, that's a that was a district decision because we, you know, There's we have four. There's nothing in statute that says. We have four at Lakeland. No, we have three. We know what we do. Mm -hmm. What is there? Four offices that There's say one of them is, One of them is a principal assistant, which is a, a certified teacher position. Okay. That's water. Yeah, and uh, Timberlake High School has actually the same number of administrators, and they've got 300 fewer kids in their building. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, Hills Falls and Coeur d'Alene have double us, and they have four. That's why I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, at some point, I mean, we've been talking around it all day, all night long. But at some point, we have to start having the hard conversations about yeah. where, yeah. Um, especially as we start to talk about what we're doing with the supplemental levy next year. So. Yeah, we just, um, you know, you have an athletic director in both of those high schools and then you have a principal who kind of is the instructional leader and an assistant principal who handles discipline. It's kind of how the jobs get divi divided up. But, you know, at our elementary schools, we've got two, one, or we have a principal. And an assistant. No, no assistant principals. They're they're principal. They have principal assistants, but they're not that's assistant that's principals. Certain, right. That's 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 and and you're right, uh, Trustee Quimby. There there is a, actually a, and there's been a lot of studies on it. A economies of scale, you know, where it is uh, does cost you a little bit more to run. I mean, if you're running a one four hundred, let's say one five hundred kid elementary school or two 250 kid elementary schools, the cost of running those two smaller buildings would be more than the cost of running that one bigger building. Right. And so it's trying to find that uh, uh, sweet spot of like what's economical, but also do you want, I mean, I worked, um, you know, grew up in Wallace and my graduating class was 82. 
I was and wondering about you. Did? <laughs> <laughs> now I got it. Now you got it. Okay. So, always a me. Join the club. It's in the list. See, that's why I have short legs. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when I ended up, you know, living in Southern California for like 15 years, I worked for Glendale Unified, and they had Glendale High School, and I'm sure they're bigger now, had over 4,000 kids. The one high school was almost bigger than our district. Right. You went to that camp, it was like, it was crazy. We had a elementary school, Horseman Elementary, at 1,300 kids. It was bigger than Timberlake. You, you should have seen kindergarten recess. It was chaos. So now, now it was actually, that, so it's more economical to run it, but is that really the program you want to run? Right. right? Is that the best service for kids? Right. So I think that's what you always try to weigh. A little bit. Anyway, that's and just. I'm sorry for the bird walk, but it is. Oh, no, you're good. But it is good. You're right that there is. So, like Coeur d'Alene does get a some economies of scale with their bigger buildings. Right. Yeah. I do have well, a have question. If 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 you have some folks who you're going to maybe jump two or three steps on the salary schedule, how would you deal with the rest of the staff in helping them to understand why that took place? That person got it, but I didn't. They shouldn't know. They shouldn't be talking about it. Oh, they do. They will. Well, this person gets both. You know what? You got hired on the wrong foot. Do you know how many times I have people in my office because of that? And I'm like, this is so unprofessional. But it is public information. Everyone's salary is. Right. Right. I think that we would, and we've thought about that, saying that, you know, like I said, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Because now we'd get beat up over that. Is that's why I think you sort of have to have sort of this is what we're doing to try to rectify this problem. Everybody is moving forward, so it's nobody there. And then if you did have a staff member, I mean, we have some bus drivers that are near the bottom of the of the scale. Well, they're they're at the top, right? So they wouldn't get the movement because they're they're vets. Um, but if you were, um, you know, somewhere there where we, you know, uh, because the custodian over the course of the last few years have moved over two columns, but they went up and now a new custodian came down, it would fix some of that. And I don't think we have to, at some point we're just going to have to say this is where you are and, and we're good. But I think it would solve some of that. It's almost like in a way when we moved them that we froze them. We didn't freeze them, but in a way they... It, yeah. it just, and I understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. It makes some sense, I, I guess. In the final analysis and when the information goes out, somebody will say, why did the board do that? Oh, I know. Right. And yeah. so yeah. it's going to be up to you folks. Right. And, and we, well, social media. We, do a, we do have a we do have a a classified uh, advisory team that has how, how that. They meet? How long is that team been meeting? Quar well, they meet quarterly, don't they? Uh, yeah. For six years since Becky came. So, and they, you know, try to have building reps and then from every group. So you have a transportation rep, a custodial right. rep, a parapro rep. We actually have a meeting coming up, our last meeting of the year. And so a lot of those communications go through that group. We get feedback like of that group. Actually, as we're, have we been mulling this over, came back and said, don't do it. We wouldn't do it. Um, I don't think that would be the feedback. Um, and then they help explain. Usually if they're on board and, and um, you know, will help uh, that process. Um, but that's sort of, uh, I mean, guess how we address it, but I would anticipate that we would hear some comments. So. Yeah, well, that communication will be and crucial in terms of acceptance right. around the Right, exactly. Right. And if we couch it in um, <laughs> trying to honor longevity <laughs> I have in, my in our district, bag. It was just a which is, they hear all the time because it's, this, it's a conversation amongst the certified staff um, every year through the IBD process. So that's language that they're used to hearing. So if we can kind of couch it in that yeah. way, I think. Yeah. Well, we don't want future collateral damage as a result of it, so no. whatever we can do to avoid that. We'll I try to avoid, that. you know, collateral damage at all costs, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Brooke doesn't like collateral damage. <laughs> I know Brooke had commented about 
you know, dropping off the, the first three columns and adding three more on, I, I would be curious to see what it would do to just remove the one and move every all of them over. What would the cost what, be? What, what would if that you, cost if be if you just took off that? Yep. And moved everybody moved over and added and another yeah. column? Mm -hmm. I don't know, Brian, are you able to do the math on that? <laughs> In, I mean, lieu, that would, in that lieu of moving people, doing the, those things, the weird well, steps he's talking or, about. Or both, in addition to you know. So that we aren't compounding the issue and creating that compaction over and over and over again where, I don't know. Yeah, because if you're just looking at one column, you know, that's not going to be the 500,000 that you anticipate. Maybe it'll only be 250. Aren't you a ray of sunshine? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I, I mean, I think if you were going to eventually take it and just say, we're going to go, you know, drop A and then B becomes A and just you move everybody a, across, that's, you know, no, another way you could address it. It doesn't address that issue of, of a, the Long senior time. staff, so. Right, um, but that's what I'm saying is do that in addition to, I know it's, it's money, well, and we got it. If, well, we certainly could do. I mean, if we started does. doing that stuff and had that for next year, we would probably run into yeah. deficit. Mm -hmm. So, and if we're yeah. having upwards to fifty percent of our classified that's staff that might be involved in the kind of we're not at least more than one staff. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the positive side of that is we got a lot of folks who are staying with us for a long period of time. We the right. classified staff is. I mean, we. We're doing, a, I mean, it's a challenge, there's no doubt, and there's those spots that you, as a board, I'm sure you've heard of, but, you know, we've held better with our bus drivers and being able to maintain our routes better than many districts in both, not just here, but in eastern Washington and, and the northwest, for sure. Um, with the veteran staff, it's getting, you know, we're concerned, but we've done okay. Honestly, I mean, we've run our routes all that. We did have to, you know, make those routes, um, you know, they, where they just weren't elementary and secondary. We sort of had to combine them so a person could get more hours. Yeah. And so that brought a lot of more of our staff, and that did help with retention because now they're Percy eligible and they're, um, and then, yeah, at 30 hours, they medical benefits. So those changes have have helped us you know across the board more and more of our paraprofessionals and and staff are benefit eligible and that's helped in the uh, recruiting and retaining and and us enhancing the medical package for next year with those dollars from the state will help in that so I mean we're hanging in there but there's a lot of challenges I mean you're right well, so I think we were going to say the same thing, so I I'll let you. So. Oh, okay. I was just thinking about Trustee Bain's suggestion. When you look at the salary schedule, if you move over, so if you go from fourteen seventy nine over to sixteen twenty six, I mean that's a significant pay increase mm -hmm. without putting the four percent on that salary schedule. And and if you just had moved that fourteen seventy nine down two steps, they would have gone from fourteen seventy nine to fifteen thirty three. So what you're suggesting actually puts a much greater increase in people's pockets. Right, and what I was gonna say is when people, I mean, having the, uh, the longevity of, say, our bus drivers, because they're, they're, they're invested, they came here, they learned that this is a great place to work, so they invested in our district. Problem is, is we can't get people to come in mm -hmm. and take that time to invest, look, and, and realize this is a good place to be on a classified salary schedule. So we have to open the door bigger. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I would say, yeah, let's take the A pay scale and let's move her away and just slide that over and create a new F schedule. Because at, to some degree, that's what we're going to have to continue to do to keep up with what's going on in our community. Well, case. I under yes, and I think at some point, if you the, the board want to do um, 
consistent major ongoing changes like that with the pay scale is that we would have to have additional revenues. Yeah. How many kids ride the bus? What percentage of the kids ride the buses in this district? Because I always see buses driving around with one kid on them. <laughs> yeah, it's always, cruise around. That's always the end of the route, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. We can get ridership right. numbers. There's uh, probably about 50%. That was, uh, was going to be my guess. John depending on the school, it's going to be well, It's required different that the depending. school provides transportation. Yeah. And it's not we a, are it's legally a, required a for special education transportation as part of their IEP. If we provide transportation, then there's rules that we have to follow from the state. I don't know. I, we could ask the question like, if you, the state does not fully fund transportation. Right. Our revenues are this year were about 1.3 million, but our costs are about 1 1.8, 1 1.9. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, you could certainly, you know, look at that. Um, if you want to hear some phone calls from parents, you we can. I mean, I'm telling you, there that would oh, sure raise eyebrows. But yeah, it's. It I don't think like the ride share. Well, they're going to have to help. Yeah. Well, which is actually, sometimes in cities, they right. they actually give them bus passes. Okay. Oh, um, which is smart. They're going to have to make a decision one way or another. They don't want to levy, and they don't want a bond, and they don't want the 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 lower grades riding with the higher grades on the bus, and they don't want all. Well, that's all great except that we cannot continue to operate the school district and, and meet the expectation when there's nothing to operate it with um you know maybe that's a conversation that we that we have with them i mean i guess we can that, that goes to educating our public right right exactly yeah i was that's gonna my ask job. you something oh someone asked did you do one of those blasts this morning about extra guards and everything at the school presence, police presence. Did I Did you? out to parents? Yeah. No, because no. I'm not the current superintendent. Did Becky, Becky do it? So I don't. Did she? It did I don't know. Did I'm one just, go out? I didn't get I one. If I was just wondering if so. Do. I don't think we're concerned about the yeah. shooting in Texas. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, I, I, didn't I definitely thought either. about that, but I, I don't do sky alerts. Because they wanted to make sure we cared about it uh, yep. yeah well and you you at least were able to say well i know that we had extra yeah. patrols so yeah, but yeah know. you're right that should have gone out to the yeah. parents so. Appreciate that. and they were at least you did in the building I do have on the video. Thought on how to communicate mm -hmm. with the community i'll share it with excellent <clears throat> i'll take all the advice i can get i was telling brooke that <clears throat> that just well, that one facebook page has Ten thousand or eleven thousand people on it. Rockford Community News. Every month. Yeah. They might. Yeah. They might. Just share to it. Oh, that is what we do in the Can we charge for busing? I think we can. Um, but I think it, it's only if they're. We charge so what is? I say I know that. If they're within a mile, we don't mm -hmm. have to provide transportation. It's actually a mile and a half. A mile and a half. Right? So it's a mile and a half, you don't have to. Um, so the rules are, you can. You, you can run it within a mile and a half. The state just won't reimburse you. Right. By their formula. So unless it's a designated safety route. So for example, we bus students from Radiant Lake over to Betty Kiefer. Mm -hmm. And we're able to get the reimbursement back from the state uh, at their levels because you're crossing Highway forward. 41. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say there was a, you know, maybe a, a bridge over, a pedestrian bridge over. The state may say, no, the kids could walk and, and it's less than a mile and a half and they wouldn't get reimbursement. Isn't the city actually, aren't they actually doing that? They're creating some sort of a path, or maybe it's no, just no. a stoplight. That wasn't the original plan. Another stoplight. Stoplight, that's what it is, right. with a crosswalk but that, for kids. So that's, that's on that, um, but yeah, we aren't able to, if you offer transportation, it's, 
you know, we don't charge. I know we don't charge. What I said was, can we? I don't believe so. Um, because you're getting reimbursed from state. That, I, I, I could have to research it. I don't know if anybody does. I don't think we can. Well, I don't think, I mean, I don't know that anybody does, but I do know in, in other areas, people are doing, being charged for busing. But um, I think it would go against that that fees law, wouldn't it? I, the, yeah, that we, jokey. Yeah, we. I don't think we could charge. Um, I don't unless we are providing some enhanced service for some reason. I mean, we have to get our stops approved, and um, I don't Wake think we could. <laughs> I don't think we could charge one family. Yeah, you have to pay, but you don't have to. I think there would be some issues that we get involved in I don't know for sure yeah no I hear you I just think that if that is an option that that needs to be presented to the public you know you don't want to pay um, on any of these four corners so then what's going to happen is if you need to utilize busing services you are going to need to pay for them individually and what would that look like correct so, I see I, I honestly think that um, I don't know a lot of that if you just weren't going to provide the service, then it it would be on the responsibility of the parent to get their child to school. I understand that. But what I'm saying is if we are providing, I mean, we provide lunch services and people have to pay for those. So Not everybody, though. Well, they can qualify for right. free and reduced. But that's what I'm, I'm just trying to consider what options there may be out there. Just thinking help. outside the box. Right. Trying to. Uh, to help either supplement busing or because that is a humongous expense and it's not something we're required to provide and I know that it would be hugely detrimental not to provide it but what are our other options I, I think so yeah I mean those are things you definitely could look at some of okay. it you have to also say this is the cost of running the school district and the cost of doing business. Did you just know? gas prices is crazy. Yeah, diesel is very expensive. Yeah. Even though some of our buses are running on gas now, which helps, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so one last minor tweak on the last salary schedule that I would, I would um, ask you to consider is uh, just a reclassification of where the HR director is on that salary schedule um, with the level of responsibility the column that she's that, that position is currently in um, the other uh, um, positions that are in there don't have that nearly the same level of responsibility so I would I, the only change to this would be that I would move the HR director one column over. Isn't that broke? We can't say oh. that. <laughs> well, she's sitting here. Sorry. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can well, only she's ever, sitting in here. You can only ever say our names but without, nobody else. without, yeah. So the college, I, would, I was noticing this too. The college and career advisor only works at Lakeland. Why is this a district? No, they have one at Timberlake. And Erin mm -hmm. is Timberlake's called Erin. Aaron. Yeah, and so the, the reason why they're on this is because they're not a certified position and they're a classified position, but they are a salaried position. So they can't be on the regular classified matrix. And they're also required to have a bachelor's degree. Yeah. We it's, just only have one on here because uh, it needs to be updated. Okay. <laughs> that would be one. Okay. <laughs> okay. We do have one at both high schools. Uh, we don't have one at Mountain View, but we do have it at the two comprehensive high schools. Okay. So I thought there was, but that's why I was like, Yeah, and not, it's, I mean, there are people who have vacated positions that are still on this that have to be updated. Yeah, and then these have been updated. Waiting to see what happens tomorrow night. So this is last so year's. What, what position? <laughs> this is last year's form. <laughs> yes, this is last year's. What position did you decide to conduct? Oh, the, the college and career advisor position. 
that's, that's, a class, that's a classified position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a salaried it's position. Because they don't have a certificate. Yeah. We have a couple of those that, like the armed guards, another one. They have supervisory responsibility. It's because of where they are as far as how much they're making at this point in time. They don't have supervisory experience. Because we had a little discussion. Yeah, I thought that that was, yeah. yeah. So we could build, I guess, a matter. <laughs> Not trying to create a problem by this. Yeah, that's what other. we were yeah. told was that that, that is a position true. that couldn't be because they didn't have supervisory. Yes. supervisory. That, that yeah. you're very yes, you're correct. So could you move them down, kind of where the armed guards are? Yeah, yeah. But if you but it's still salary. Um, it's you still have to make them the same. We're living a little in the gray there. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't you know. You know, th it's not an issue now, but possibly in the future. I, I, I don't have any heartburn about paying people's salary, but I think we need to have consistency. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, so what is your proposal? Lisa, regarding the HR director position. I would, um, <coughs> let's see, yeah, I would move, hmm? uh, move the position to, to column D, D, and I would move, um, I mean, we could move her even to, like, D1, because I'm not looking to necessarily do a big increase in salary, but it, it gives her the opportunity for growth. Um, and then with the 4%, it'll be a decent um, pay increase, but it gets her into the right column. And that is that D1 is um, a little bit more than what she's making now. Mm, nope. No. Because that was the cur that oh. current looks like it was probably the 2021. Oh, sorry. Year. Yeah, you're right. So I was looking at the wrong column. It still is. It would need to be at least a step two. To two. And remember, this doesn't have the four percent increase on it yet either. So, um, so it would have to be. D step two for next minimum. year. For next mm -hmm. year. For step three. Putting her on there for next year. Correct. Okay. Yep. Once we put the four percent on there and I see what the actual numbers are gonna end up Just being, then I then I can make mm -hmm. a I'll make that determination and mm -hmm. talk to Brian about that. Um, I just wanted to make sure you were okay with that m movement as far as the, the other jobs that are in that particular column. So is there a stipend on that position? Well, she or was extra days. She was getting a stipend because of the additional um, amount of responsibility and work that she was doing. So this would take care of the stipend. So I the way I see it, we need to put her or put that position at least at a step three. Put her on the three for next year. Maybe step three. So is the, how many days is a classified administrator? I'm 260. 260, 260. Oh. yeah. yeah. Looks like nose, I'm the only one. Nose to the grindstone. 260. 260. Okay. Yeah. So that will eliminate the stipend. So what are we doing with all these other positions? They're staying there too. The only, I just I moved that. The only reason I'm moving that one is because mm -hmm. when you look at the the positions that are in column C, mm -hmm. um, the level of responsibility is um, for the HR director is is great. There's just a oh lot yeah, of responsibility. absolutely. Yeah. So I just I'm just asking to reclassify the position. I'm not right. even looking at the salary. 
I just was looking at the classification for the position. Strange question. Why do we have a lane E? That nobody's if in nobody's in it. Oh, uh, that's the uh, CFO lane. No, the CFO is in lane F. Oh. There is nobody in lane E. <laughs> I don't know. Why do we have any? Because there's, a, there's a big F? gap. No. Because <laughs> because our gap. CFO was expensive. Mm -hmm. When we did that, they wanted to have it. If you went across one column, that one column didn't have a big jump, that there was more consistent. That was why. Okay. Could be. I mean, in some districts, tech directors are are higher level. Um, it, even some of our peer districts, so it did give us a capacity that if we felt it was appropriate to move some type of positions there, that there's a place to go. Okay. So, with respect to budget, did we come to a determination of, I was just going to ask that question. Yeah. Let's circle back. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> Tie it up in a nice bow. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, 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 curiosity. <coughs> we have a new transportation supervisor. That shows the one who yeah, retired. We'll, we'll update it and so she ended up step one the in one that, that call. The one coming in was not at that salary. Yet. No, yeah. she's at step one. Okay. On lane A? Where the transportation director is, and I think they're in B. Lane C. They're in oh, lane, they're C. lane C. Yeah. Okay. We have no positions that are in, that begin in a lane E. Correct. Okay. But there's a gap that we could Correct. Move. We can stick some position there. two if we needed to without having to bump them clear up to seem to an F. Right. Yeah. So going back. So we're not going <coughs> to get rid of That's the HR uh, stipend, the, the HR director stipend. Mm -hmm. One more victory. Yep, that's why I said another one bites the dust. I, I, I just want you to know I heard what you said and I'm trying to whittle away at it. So I appreciate you indulging me through that long conversation, but I, I didn't want to bring these to you in June and have changes and not have any opportunity to talk about them. And it does affect the budget, so I felt like it made sense to do it tonight. I want to thank you guys for all the information you provided tonight. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. it it's a whole lot better to do it now than in June. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, when we have to make the decisions. Yeah. yeah. It's looking yeah. much more open. And we managed to do it without a presentation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, not that I don't well, we mind it along the way. Yeah, I, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, Instead of I, somebody standing at a podium right. and going yeah. to slide to. I wouldn't want to have to sit through on my continuum. <laughs> sat too way too I know. <laughs> so do we have direction with the budget in respect to the being over our fund balance? Sixteen percent. Uh, do we have do we have a direction with that? And are we clear on that direction and what we're going to do? Well, I don't think we have enough information to make any decision with that. We have. No, no, no. Uh, not, I mean, not, I'm not meaning how we're going to spend it. I'm meaning where we're going to put it. Because you're right. We don't have information. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to make a transfer. transfer. I, I, question. I mean, I, I think there's, if, in line with policy, I think that if in the budget, which I could change, on a technical level, you know, the next by next week we need to advertise the budget to meet the just the timelines given to us. Right. Yeah, those were my questions I had. Um, is posting 
we have to post it 10 day, at least 10 days before the hearing date. So for having the hearing date on the 15th of June, we have to post by Friday, June 3rd. Yeah, well, we're, Sunday, but I don't we're going to be Sunday, fine. So. We're going to make it. Okay. So um, that, you know, currently the, you know, I didn't put a, like a big transfer from the general fund to another place for those. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the policy says, you know, if you get above that 16.66%, um, you know, the board will consider using the extra or the the, un, the fund balance for one-time expenditures. Um, so I can certainly have budget reflect um, a transfer from the general fund sometime next year. We, we don't have to do the transfer, um, you know, July 1. It could be at a, at a time maybe, if you wanted to wait till the audit, we could do it before. From the general fund to I would put it right now in, in our fund 231, which is sort of our local facilities fund. That fund we've used for, let's say we get a rebate from a VISTA, mm -hmm. which maintenance has some revenues, or our facility use funds, we, real life uses Timberlake High School, we get some revenues from there. If So revenues like, if recycling revenues, we put there mm -hmm. when we get those. We can use that fund, I mean obviously it'd be a lot bigger now, and transfer those funds there um, as part of budget, and then the board, you know, at the time when they really want to consider the actual amount of transfer, you know, that what we actually did the transfer would better match budget, the actual would match budget, and I could build that in into the advertisement so people would see that. It would sort of show that, you know, obviously that you have a start balance of nine and you're going to have an end balance, let's say, of seven, mm -hmm. that you're, in a sense, you're running a deficit in the general fund, but the transfer shows why that's happening. Right. I mean, if you want to see the, if you, the other thing would be to do the transfer this fiscal year and then our start balance would be less, but it would just be a guess on our start balance. Mm -hmm. I, then I don't think it really makes a difference as far as the net effect of what the board is doing. What do you think on that? On I know you were thinking doing it sooner so that it doesn't show up on that starting. Yeah, I, and again, my primary thinking there is, is with respect to clarity and transparency mm -hmm. with the public. Mm -hmm. I don't think it makes any difference to us and how we operate. It, it makes a difference as to the picture that people get right. from that. Because basically all they'll see, you know, 99% of the public is only gonna see that even if they bother to take a look at it in the newspaper. They're not going to come to the budget hearing and hear the detail of how that's going to happen. No, but, and, and the thing about this, they'll, they're will they going to see the same overall balance. It's either going to be in the general fund or in the other fund. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> the numbers are going to be the same. So but if I, they I, look at totals... It kind of addresses that other issue of clearly setting aside funds for capital purposes. And I don't know, maybe there's a way to do that within the general fund budget showing, but I, it, it, it's just clearer to me to do it that way, I guess. See, I think it would be, I, I agree. I, I think it's clearer to see it in the actual budget as opposed to if I did a, the transfer now, that's not budgeted. I didn't budget a, a big right. transfer like that right. this year. So if you budget the transfer, you say, in our budget, we plan to do this, and then we did it. Well, yes, yeah. that's a counter argument. I guess. Yeah. So I, but you know, you, I can see your where you what you're saying. If you're just John Doe public and taking a look at what the district's doing with respect to how much money they have at the end of the year and how much money they're going to spend on capital outlay and that sort of thing, the clearer we can make that picture, I think, the better off we are. Yes. But it works either way, obviously. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, if someone really, of a, of a patron wanted to get in the weeds, I think there would have to be ex either way. Explanation, it, yes. Yeah, correct, right. yeah. There's some weedy people. Uh, as long as it doesn't become restricted funds, I mean, I have no problem with saying we think we're going to put you know, spend this much here and we think this much here, but I don't want to show it all of this capital outlay and then we go, 
oh, we need it for whatever, right. or, yep. you know, or, <clears throat> oh, we're going to do this much for curriculum, and then, you know, the boiler goes out somewhere, or, you know, the heating goes out, or, but I agree, I do think it does look more transparent to the public when they look at the budget if they see some kind of delineation, some kind of line item thing. Well, and it's it's going to be, I think, crucial this year to explain mm -hmm. that that money is being set aside for capital. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to do that year after year, it won't need as much explanation because that's how we've done. That's how we've been doing it. People will, I think, understand. the people that care to know will know, and they'll. They won't continue to ask the question, I think. Yeah, and our ability to do that going forward may become less as a right. result of overall how the financial picture unfolds. But the biggest right. thing is, is we have to stop hiding the ball. You, you, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have a, an opportunity to establish a precedent here that makes some sense, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, even if, I mean, if we, if we move it over and we have it established, and there is a year where you know we really can't allocate monies there because it's not there. Well, that's a lot easier to see and explain than to try and explain why one year we had all sorts of money and what did you do with it and we don't know where it went or how it went. We know it went and you know, it, it just, we, we need a better way of, mm -hmm. of navigating this. And having that much access. Well, I think we have a consensus about what to. needs to be done. It's a matter yeah. of whether you do it at this point in time or at that point in time, and, and how that gets reflected budget-wise. So, mm -hmm. but I think we're we've got a consensus that we need to make this move. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you you can't or you can do do it now. We can we could make the transfer now. So all I was saying is that this year, if you look at our budget. If we did that large transfer this year, it would be a big variation from budget. What we actually did is a big difference from budget. If we did the transfer next October, or whatever the timing may be, and we put it in budget that we, we saw that we thought we we're gonna have this large surplus, and we're taking some of it and we're gonna move it over there, then it would be in budget, and then actuals, whatever the actual number is, might vary a little bit from the estimate would um, those two actions would would be closer in alignment for that fiscal year as opposed to having this big you didn't plan any transfers and suddenly you move two million dollars over and there's no budget line ever for it the budget to actuals would match more yeah. correct right. so and if we thing. if we advertise this year's budget with that transfer yep. and do it next fiscal year which is just a few months you know a right. month away mm -hmm. July 2 the budget and actuals will sort of yeah will sort of match and we could either do it that early or we could you know wait until you guys have like if you really wanted the fund balance to be right at 16.66 yeah, so i don't think that's I mean, you know i don't know it's some of it is mm -hmm. how you'd want to move forward but well, i mean yeah. we, i'd say we line item the budget anticipation of what it's going to be and then based on the audit find out what our actual fluff is and then determine you make the a decision that we're going to change it from the make budgeted it, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah the only thing that I would see is that uh, you know I would prefer to have the transfer made on July 2nd or whatever as soon as the fiscal yeah. year begins so we have the ability to begin to you know, authorize use projects mm -hmm. use, utilizing that fund I agree. if you wait until August or October or sometime a lot of your working season for that kind of money is on bar. Well, right. you, yeah, what I'm saying though is if spring. definitely let's do it July 2. I'm in agreement with that. When we come down to the audit, if it, we discover that we were off and there's actually more, more. then we can move more over. We can adjust it time. to actually right. more closely. Right. 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 We could do, and we could if you wanted me just to be. Um, for a, a starting number, I guess. I mean, I could, you know, start with, let's say, a 
a number of 2.5 because that's what we sort of think the increase is going to be this year, roughly. So it sort of matches mm -hmm. that. Um, and that would be reflected in budget. And then in July, I mean, we could move maybe half of it over. Because you don't have to do it all in one year. And so you, mm -hmm. the board is sort of given capacity for that. And then maybe move the other half of the actuals later when you, you know, because we still would have capacity for projects at that point. Um, you know, d definitely on what on what would be happening, and you know, and a lot of the projects, of depending on on where the board, you know, really wants some resources to go, you know, maybe out several months, or maybe even have to wait till the next building season, just the so way contractors are right now. Right, right? it's just right. their their schedule, their summer schedules are booked right now. Right. So it's and it just may take us the winter to do the estimates and and, and some of the work of your prioritization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I don't want to miss forget about the increase we're seeing across the district. If we're going to have to um, hire more staff to yeah. fill those, or I mean, like I don't even know where we would put more staff, but right. you That's know, bigger issue. you have to find a classroom <laughs> to put them in first. But that was the other thing is I would want to make sure that we are. You know, although that's an ongoing expense. Um, Not after August 1st. That's the one benefit to the right. category one is yeah. for those emergency hires after registration numbers come in, is that it's truly that job ends at the end of that year. Yeah. And then we reassess based on our enrollment whether we need that position to continue or not. Um, and if our enrollment is up, and it is sustained and we need the position then that means we're actually generating additional oh, right. revenue yes. mm -hmm. because we have more kids yeah so that does help us as far as one time money mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> because that alone could be I mean, depending million more dollars you know and I th we came and asked for one point four, I think, yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. and that was with a two hundred student increase. I'm praying that we don't have two hundred more kids this next right. year because I don't know where we're putting them. If they, if we do have two hundred more, I'm hoping they're all at Timberlake High School and Lakeland High School. It's a lot easier <laughs> in those buildings to add kids. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so then for from the board buy-in, understanding that we want the money moved over into its own special place, what would you, I mean, what direction do you need from the board, if any? Um, is it a dollar amount? Is it a date? Is it, what do you need from us? Yeah, I, I think one is, you know, as if I use a dollar amount, just to use a round number of 2.5 million and just sort of build that as it, you would see, obviously, on this, you know, for example, this sheet mm -hmm. in the general fund, you would see on the expenditure side, at, instead of 90,000 transferred, it'd be the 2.5 plus the 90. That, that 90,000 transfer is going out to Medicaid, that pass through right, account. Right, right. So that would increase, and then obviously, on the revenue side, up here and other funds, there would be a transfer in of counter that where it'd be going. So you'd see that line would be in budget, mm -hmm. um, and then so that's one if that amount is good enough, and then our it'd be planned to do next year, and then if you wanted some of those dollars moved, do you want them all done in July? Do you want a partial just to get some stuff going, and then? true up and later in the year when we have those numbers those are options that the board could consider okay so then i would think that at our budget hearing is where we would vote on and give direction with regard to that mm -hmm. well he'll, yeah he'll prepare based on but i have to the scenario that but the scenario talking. i just did i have to prepare for this publication right. yeah okay so you need to know okay Okay. That I guess the timing of the transfer that could definitely be at the budget hearing if if the board wanted to think about that, um, you know. And there's times where we've done transfers, you know, 
not just the whole meal deal one time a year. Well, there are some built-in transfers across the total budget. Correct. And so those typically take place at the beginning of the fiscal year? Or? Mm, uh, often some of them are at the end. Um, like this year, oh, some of the transfers are indirects from federal grants, so we but sort of do that. But in the published budget, you've got authorization to do it. Correct. Yeah. And, and so we could make sure we do those. So if a project came up right away that we had to fund, we could certainly just move, the money move it right there and, the and have the authority from the board. And then it would be reflected in, in this. And then if the board later, I, you know, if we did get the actuals and you want to do the actual amount and true up after the audit, you know, that could be a, a vote of the board saying that, you know, the new amount the is, is it, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot different than what we've already, you know, if it was really close, then maybe the board would say we're close, but if it was significantly different, the board might want to say, you know, adjust that amount. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So, I think, so I'll, I'll build it in in the advertisement so you'll see it and then... And you'll build in 2.5, correct? Correct. Okay. So does 2.5 bring us down to 16.6% of the... or 16% of the fund balance? Um, I'll it? make sure that we get okay. at least to that point. I right. guess so uh, if, I, if I need to have a, a few hundred dollars added on there, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whatever it takes to bring it down to right. that. To at least on the estimate. Yeah. Right. Okay. We'll do that. Yes. Well, when so I that... Definitely looks like that is our intent, and that is what we're following through with. Okay. Right. Two point five won't bring us down to the six point six. It'll still be above it. Sixteen point six. Yeah, the six fifteen. Should be close, right. but yeah, we'll we'll, well two definitely. Two million six fifty seven eight twenty seven brings us down to the sixteen point six. Okay. Okay. So two point five, okay. we're still a little over, but I think then once we have the audit and we see exactly where the number is, who knows? We may then be. At the sixteen point six or yeah, below. Yeah, depending on what we use or between we now and then, if we yeah, decide yeah, on still additional pro projects this year. Right. Well, I mean, not probably not in the next month, but yeah. <laughs> budgets are all built on estimates, so mm -hmm. yeah, correct. But, yeah. yeah, but I certainly, for at least with the estimates, we'll we'll have it tie tie in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, do we have? Or do we need further discussion on any of the budget uh, information that's been provided at this moment? I don't think I do. Okay. Nope. So then, for Sarah, we can go ahead and um, we will uh, end the workshop. We'll go ahead and get us out. Okay, it's 8 9 57.